Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Jeanette and I are just going to start with a few introductory materials before we um, uh, before we jump into the presentations that are workshop today. I hope we have a good interactive workshop. Um, each each presentation is going to be about 20 minutes long, and then there'll be 10 minutes for Q&A. So please do be thinking about questions and discussion topics for that um, 10 minutes of Q&A. So we can have a good interactive discussion. And um, post questions and comments anytime in the chat, that'll help us prepare for the discussion. This workshop is sponsored by Trusted CI, the NSF Cybersecurity Center, Center of Excellence. Uh, we have the mission to support uh, the cybersecurity ecosystem to enable trustworthy science across NSF research projects and facilities. We're a collaborative project uh, between Indiana University, NCSA, Berkeley Lab, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and the University of Wisconsin. So uh, at the PERC, conference this week, we're all thinking about cyber infrastructure. And, um, and so for this workshop today, we're thinking about the security of cyber infrastructure. And so I just wanted to level set that we think about not just the computers and the networks, but also the data and the scientific instruments and, and the people and, and the software um, are, are all very relevant for our discussion of security. And uh, NSF is funding over 11,000 research projects each year. And so uh, the needs of these projects are diverse across uh, many fields of science, making the needs of those projects in terms of cybersecurity diverse. In some cases, research is involving regulated information. So you'll hear it this morning um, about compliance like HIPAA, FISMA, NIST 800-171. But you'll also hear about unregulated research that also has challenging cybersecurity needs. In some cases, the, the challenge is because there's not compliance uh, uh, giving specific guidance. And so there's some ambiguity. There's certainly diversity of the projects across a wide variety of scientific disciplines. And we care about the research risks about both regulated and unregulated research. Compliance is not our only driver in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, not just confidentiality, but also integrity and availability. Uh, cybersecurity incidents can result in reputational harm and funding loss. And just in general, researchers on campus have worries and questions that cybersecurity guidance, cybersecurity um, uh, assistance uh, can, can definitely be appreciated. But we have to always be aware that the researchers are busy, the information security people are busy, there's a culture clash. And so uh, we all want to uh, work together to support the research mission in a, in a trustworthy environment. And so I mentioned my, uh, my main concern about the workshop logistics is that we have a good discussion after each presentation. So I'm going to be cutting off presentations right at the 20 minute mark. So we have uh, at least 10 minutes for discussion. And um, next, Jeanette is going to go over some more workshop logistics before we move on to the presentations. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jeanette Dalpide. Um, I'm going to go over a few things uh, real quickly so we can get started. Uh, first, we have our schedule. So this is our opening remarks and welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, then we're going to move on to the Trusted CI Framework, a minimum standard for cybersecurity programs. Then next, uh, Google Drive, the, known un the unknown unknowns. Then we have uh, at nine, or uh, all times are or in Pacific time, I should say. Um, then we have uh, the experiencing uh, integrating experiences, integrating and operating custom security services. Then we have a 10 minute break and then we'll, we'll do the next two presentations, drawing parallels and synergies between NSF and NIH cybersecurity projects and how NCOMMON is helping its members meet NIH requirements for federated credentials. So that we put those NIH presentations together um, intentionally. So we hope to get some good discussion out of that. And then um, finally wrap up and final thoughts. Um, so we're all spread across the country. So again, those are Pacific times. So I'm in central, which means it's 10 a.m. my time. If you're in Eastern, it's, it should be 11 a.m. That's right. Yep, thanks, Jim. You can go ahead and continue. And then please uh, take advantage of our professional development survey uh, or uh, badges. 
Um, this is a new program that we started. This is our first time using it in a workshop. So if you have any feedback on that, that'd be great too. Um, so if you'd like to request documentation of attending this, the, the workshop today for your professional development purposes, please go to this link. And actually I'll throw it in the chat right now real quick. So you can click on it in the chat because you can't click on it in your screen. So here it is. And now we also have a, just a, a brief uh, feedback question, but you're also beginning an anonymous survey from PERC. So you have the choice to give your feedback there or give your feedback to the PERC survey. Um, and next, please. Our workshop materials, I've posted this in the chat. I'll post it again, um, are available on our website. Um, there's a link there. Um, you can find uh, our agenda and you can find a link to the Google Drive where we've been sharing presentations. And next slide, please. And all right, let's go with uh, Trusted CI Framework, a minimum standard for cybersecurity programs. Scott? Great, thanks, Jeanette. I'll go ahead and share my screen real quickly here. I think this is the right one, but all right, is everyone seeing my slides? We see the uh, Google slide view, not the presenter view. All right, good now? Yep, yep. Yeah, I think I can't share my screen while in presenter view, at least not easily. All right, well, uh, welcome everyone. And uh, thanks for coming out this morning. I realize it's, it's early for some, but this is like, you know, this is a good time for uh, us on the East Coast. Uh, so my name is Scott Russell, I'm a senior policy senior policy analyst at the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. I'm also the program lead for the Trusted CI Framework with Trusted CI. Uh, I'm here with uh, Ranson Ricks and Emily Adams, who are both on the Trusted CI Framework team. And we're going to try and give you just like a very quick introduction to the Trusted CI Framework. Like we could talk about this topic for hours. We have talked about it for hours in other forums. So uh, this is our 20 minute intro. Definitely want to leave time for Q&A at the end. So um, hopefully we'll leave you wanting more. So I guess you know the big question to start off with is just what is the Trusted CI Framework? Um, I imagine some people here are probably familiar with it, but I'm going to kind of assume that this is completely new to you. Uh, in short, this is a minimum standard for cybersecurity programs. Now, we'll unpack those terms a little bit more, specifically cybersecurity programs. But the idea of a minimum standard is uh, we're just trying to set like the bare baseline requirements for how you manage cybersecurity kind of as a business or as an organization. So this is not a list of technical controls. This is not like the specific operations or like incident response. It's not that level of cybersecurity. This is at an organizational level. It's how do you deal with it at an organizational level? So a uh, couple of just big bullet points I wanna get out there. Number one, it is uh, the framework consists of 16 clear and concise requirements. We didn't want there to be a whole lot of, you know, wishy-washy sort of like fuzzy things. We want it to be pretty clear if you're doing something or if you're not doing it. We also wanted this to be very tractable. We didn't want um, a lot of times cybersecurity requirements can seem, uh, you know, almost unachievable. You know, if, you, if you're doing like FISMA high, for some people, you know, starting from scratch, that's just really intimidating. We don't want this to be intimidating. We want this to be something that anyone can pick up and do with a reasonable amount of effort. Uh, second big bullet point here is uh, basically that we didn't just make this up, that this is based off of best practices. It's based off of uh, evidence of what works. It's based off of uh, a lot from our experience as Trusted CI, engaging with the research community, with the science and research community, seeing sort of like the challenges and the problems that in that uh, space and uh, trying to build a framework that really helps uh, uh, solidify some of those uh, weaknesses that we're seeing. Uh, and the final point, even though, um, you know, we are trusted CI, we are primarily uh, interfacing with, you know, the research, education, science community, uh, the framework itself is actually universal and timeless. These are not, uh, you know, very uh, set in time types of requirements that are going to change in five years or 10 years. Everything in the framework is designed to, you know, hopefully last forever, but at least, you know, like last the 50 year mark. Like this is something that you should be able to adopt and just stick to for a long time. And it's universal, right? It's not specific to any specific, it's not specific to a community. Uh, anyone could adopt this as long as they have a need for a cybersecurity program. And we think that all of the requirements we've set out would apply to them. So uh, briefly, 
focuses on uh, programmatics. Uh, our buzzwords we use here are our four pillars of mission alignment, governance, resources, and controls. And with, within each of those pillars, we have a series of musts, which are those 16 clear and concise requirements. So the pillars are a little bit, you know, a little bit fuzzy. The, the uh, musts are pretty clear. And uh, this final point, I kind of already alluded to this, but it is not another list of technical requirements, right? This is not a control set. Uh, controls are very important in cybersecurity, and we, we have a lot of thoughts about them, like how to do it well. And they're involved in the framework, but we are not going to say, you know, you have to have, you know, IDS and, you know, a hundred other things, multi-factor. This is about the programmatics. Okay, so here is just the very quick uh, one-page version of the Trusted CI Framework Musts. Uh, there's a link in the slides. Uh, we could also hopefully put some put that in chat. Um, but as you'll see here, 16 musts uh, broken down between the four pillars. I'm not going to walk through them all in great detail. If you have any questions about them, feel free to ask them at the end. But I just want to highlight sort of the range of things that's happening here. We say, you know, uh, organizations must tailor their cybersecurity program to the organization's mission, right? That's not a control. This is something that's much broader. But also we've down here in the resources pillar, organizations must establish and maintain a cybersecurity budget. A lot of times people talk about cybersecurity and they list off a whole lot of cybersecurity things you need to do, but they don't talk about how you're going to pay for it. And we're very interested in that question of how you're going to pay for it and how you're going to manage it. So that's the kind of level the framework is uh, operating at. Common question we'll get though is, why a new framework, right? There's so many frameworks out there. Most people have heard of at least a couple of them and maybe are, have a little bit of framework fatigue. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, we just felt like this didn't exist already. There's a lot of more control focused frameworks. There wasn't one that was about a minimum standard for cybersecurity programs. And we think that's a really important piece of cybersecurity that's missing. Another one is this, that existing frameworks that we have tend to see we we tend to find some problems with right either they're really expensive we think they're incomplete or they're just impractical and so we wanted to make something that was none of those things we wanted it to be more complete we wanted to be inexpensive and we wanted to be practical um and finally well, not finally on finally on this slide i should say um a lot of cybersecurity is very focused on controls and doesn't touch on this other stuff and we really wanted to make sure that we get the other stuff in there and uh so this framework is very focused on that. And then again, this goes back to a previous point I mentioned. Uh, a lot of times there's just not a whole lot of funding for uh, cybersecurity, I mean, particularly in the research world. And uh, as we say, particularly for personnel, I think because personnel are ongoing costs and those can be a little bit scary for organizations. You know, you might be willing to spend $100,000 on, you know, Splunk or something for one year, but having to do that every year tends to be less common. And also the governance for uh, cybersecurity tends to be kind of buried in the organization to the point where the organizational leaders don't have a whole lot of visibility, at least until a problem arises. And uh, finally, it's just that uh, Trusted CI is engaged with this community a lot. And we have shown just a huge variety in uh, the maturity of the cybersecurity effort in that community. And so we wanted to build something that could be useful across that whole range of maturity. And then just this final point, uh, this is the definition we are using for what is a cybersecurity program. Uh, I think the key point here is that it's a bunch of, they are ongoing, right? They're not projects that have a discrete end. And that when you have a program, you obtain benefits man from managing them collectively that you would not get if you had to manage them all individually. So this is uh, adapted from a fairly common uh, definition of programs. But we've added a cybersecurity flair to it. And with that, I think I'm going to pass the mic to Ranson. All right, awesome. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining this morning. As Scott mentioned, it's pretty early over on the on the West Coast, but it's almost lunchtime here uh, on the East Coast. So, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, building off of what Scott talked about in terms of what a cybersecurity program is. We're going to talk about what a uh, cyber program is not. Specifically, it's not a plan uh, that you you lay out. Uh, this is it's not a project because the project has a start and an end. Uh, this is something that is ongoing, and as Scott mentioned, it's not just implementing a set of. 
Uh, Ransom, you just got muted, I think. Sorry, Ransom, my bad. Okay, no problem. I didn't say any bad words either. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it's not a project. A uh, project is something that starts and ends. Uh, uh, this is a program uh, and it, it resides at the organizational level uh, and it's not something that you can finish and be checked off. So as soon as you say, for example, you implement some part of the cybersecurity program, three years later, the threat changes. Uh, so you have to constantly update to make sure you can address uh, the threat and also your mission. Uh, next slide, please. So Scott mentioned that the framework uh, has four pillars and 16 musts. Uh, we recently published a, an implement, implementation guide that really provides some pretty explicit details and information on getting started and implementing uh, the uh, four pillars in 16 months to build your program. Uh, it includes uh, roadmaps for establishing your program, uh, it has tailored advice, uh, points of resources and tools and templates that are available on our website freely to use for anyone. And it's built on uh, trusted CI's experience and multiple institutional team and it's been vetted by our Framework Advisory Board, which is a group of uh, 21 professionals across all verticals in the research and education community uh, that really gave us some great advice to put this thing together. Uh, this particular guide is designed simply for research uh, cybersecurity operators that we call RCOs. And we define RCO as an organization that operates on premise, cloud-based or hybrid computational and data information management systems, scientific instruments, uh, visualization environments, networks, and or technologies that enable knowledge, breakthroughs and discoveries. Uh, so this is specifically designed for this particular area. So if you're dealing with research and special instruments, this document is built just for you. Um, the education community has quite a few requirements that differ from industry and government. And we felt it was necessary to have a document that will help address those special needs that are in our community. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of getting started, uh, here's a link to a trusted CI.org framework. Uh, there's a getting started page there. Uh, if you click on the green button, you'll be able to access the actual uh, framework information guide for RCOs. Uh, and it has also links to templates and tools that you can use to get your program uh, up and running. Uh, but most importantly, uh, to start your program, you're really going to have to have some buy-in from your cybersecurity team and also uh, the leadership in the organization. So you can start by socializing uh, the framework. We're not asking you to make sure everybody uh, has a deep understanding of what the framework actually is and how it's going to work, but just a basic understanding of the concepts and how it's going to benefit your organization. Uh, and for leadership, it's very important to understand and answer those whys. Why are we doing X, Y, or Z? So they understand how you're managing uh, the cybersecurity program across the entire organization. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Scott. Yeah, I think uh, just a couple other things I'm gonna, I'll say on the, the question of getting started. One is, uh, I mean, this is probably the most common question that we would get from people who are unfamiliar with it because you got to get started. 
And it is very context dependent. Like when we get into the specifics of, you know, what should my organization do? It's going to depend a lot on the current cybersecurity posture of your organization. You know, are you an existing like organization with a long history or are you currently developing? Do you have cybersecurity personnel already? Do you have a budget already? So we don't, there's no cookie cutter, you know, one size fits all approach. So, um, but we do try to highlight some strategies. So like in, in the framework implementation guide, this is specific for the, cyber, the research cyber infrastructure operator community. Um, we give you just a couple of guide, guidelines where we might say, you know, in general, it's always important to make sure that you're, uh, you're making sure you're hitting like the mission pillar. That's one that's easy to postpone. And a lot of times if you postpone it, you'll realize at the end that you've made a lot of decisions that are not aligned with your mission. And that's, that's the whole point, right? We're trying to support the mission here. So there's a couple of uh, uh, things like that, but also, you know, just getting to the base level of understanding of, of just what all the framework is trying to do and just a base understanding of where you are relative to that. Like if you can do those two things, right? Read the 16 musts, understand them at least you know they're not that they're complicated when you get into the details but at a base level you should be able to read it and be like okay i know what this means or at least i'm pretty sure i know what this means and then map that to what you currently have going and uh and that should be a good starting point and actually we're going to talk a little bit more about uh some you know real world examples of that in just a second uh final slide that I'll, we're with me talking here is just a couple of next steps. Uh, so just a current event going on right now and uh, recent events, uh, Trusted CI just finished an engagement with Noir Lab, which is an SF major facility, um, specifically on adoption of the Trusted CI framework. So we published the, uh, the framework implementation guide uh, just earlier this year, and then immediately we jumped into this Noir Lab engagement. And now we're currently, uh, we're continuing that engagement and trying to uh, help Noir Lab basically implement the recommendations that we gave them from that assessment. So that's currently ongoing. Uh, we're also looking to broaden awareness and adoption of the framework across the whole research and education community. Uh, hopefully we'll have some uh, really exciting things to announce here in the near future. So just, you know, keep your eyes peeled for that. But the base idea is we wanna, we wanna spread this far and wide. We think this is something that everyone should know about and everyone should be doing. Uh, we're always looking for additional opportunities uh, for assessments and consultations and particularly feedback. Um, if you're reading the framework implementation guide and you're seeing stuff that you were like, oh, this doesn't work for us because we have unique challenges or this part is really important. Those types of things are just very valuable for us to hear. And we always welcome feedback like that. And uh, finally, the, uh, the framework implementation guide, as we said, is an audience specific deep dive. And because of that, the goal is to refresh that much more regularly. Like we said, the framework itself is designed to be, you know, sort of timeless. The requirements in there shouldn't change a whole lot, but the details of how you can best implement those requirements, those are going to vary quite a bit depending on a bunch of contextual factors. And we want to make sure we keep those up to date. So you can always keep an eye out for that as well. And then finally, I'm going to pass the Emily, uh, <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic over to Emily, not Emily over to the mic. Mm -hmm. uh, to talk a little bit about some uh, practical experiences with this at uh, CACR. All right, thank you. Well, fortunately, Zoom, you can pass me over to the mic. Um, all right, well, I just want to quickly outline some of the experiences uh, that I had uh, during the authoring and publication of the framework guide. I also served as the inaugural CISO for the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research uh, with the goal to build the CACR cybersecurity program from scratch. So uh, the framework was especially helpful as CSER is situated within a larger organization with a full security and policy infrastructure, um, which is something you'll often see highlighted within the framework uh, guide itself, uh, being a suborg of a parent organization. Uh, here's a quick uh, list of uh, some of the framework and trusted CI tools we used. Um, we especially leveraged the, uh, the framework musts uh, to be able to map uh, to see how you know, how our program is going. This was mid-year, the guide was published mid-year within the program. And it was actually really refreshing uh, to see that we were on the right track, but it also provided um, quite a bit of guidance for programmatic elements um, and even, uh, you know, bits and pieces that, that while we weren't able to address in year one, we were able to uh, continue to push on into, into year two. 
Um, so basically, uh, there, we also leverage the Trust and CI Cybersecurity Strategic Plan. Um, uh, I think it's also known as Trust and CI Timeline of Strategic Outcomes. Uh, they have a nice uh, year one single sheet. Uh, it was super helpful in mission development, and also it'll continue to be helpful in uh, uh, subsequent years. Uh, the CACR Policy Development and Life Cycle, um, the phases uh, we had applied to the life cycle, uh, it, we followed the model presented in Trusted CI's Policy Development Protocol. Uh, also, our MISP, uh, Master Information Security Policy and Procedures, while we developed that prior to the publication of the framework, um, we really did leverage uh, uh, and reevaluate our MISP when the uh, publication came out, but also we leveraged the library of existing and upcoming, uh, of, I guess, uh, uh, sorry, uh, policy. Um, uh, I just lost my notes. I'm so sorry. Uh, we leveraged uh, the policy library as, as a point of reference and how to move forward. Um, finally, uh, the CACR cybersecurity incident response, um, we were able to build that uh, as it was influenced by the, the newly published uh, trusted CI incident response policy template that came along with the FIG version two, or the policy template was version two, came along with a new FIG. Um, and we also, uh, it was influenced by the trusted CI security team incident response policy, which was always, or also uh, uh, influenced by the um, incident response policy template. Next slide, please. And finally, I know you guys can't see this, I, and I apologize, but this was our application of how we evaluated uh, our program mid-year uh, with the 16 musts. Um, so basically, uh, just, uh, you can't, I apologize, you can't see this, but uh, we had the trusted CTI framework must in the first column, uh, how it was addressed by our program. Um, we had our program uh, split up into tracks and a work breakdown structure of, of tasks. So we were able to plug and play what we were doing within this evaluation. And again, I mentioned earlier, uh, year two, uh, the year two CISO is continuing to integrate the framework and guidance into more detail. Uh, so there's a, a quick snapshot of a, a case study. And that concludes our presentation. Uh, I do believe we're 20 seconds ahead of time. So we're able to uh, uh, take questions now. And I'll pass it back to Jim. Thanks so much, Emily, Scott, and Rance. And uh, yeah, right on time. So I hope people have questions and comments. Uh, so feel free to unmute yourself if you have trouble unmuting. Uh, try the raise hand function or post in the chat and I'll, I'll help you out. So I have a question about the timelines for implementing these. Like, you know, it's not a project, it's ongoing, but there's that initial hump of adopting it and aligning it. Um, so do you, like in your experience, uh, how long has that taken? And then subsequently, I guess, what's the sort of a, you know, anticipated time commitment? Um, and I, I say this from you know, another sort of element of this that we have is that uh, we're not like an institution, we're more like a, a cross-institutional project. And so aligning with some of these missions and all is, uh, is complicated because multiple institutions are involved potentially. And so you know, balancing this commitment of time um, across institutions and, and all is, is challenging, I guess, because of the way the funding flows. So can you just talk about sort of the implementation experiences a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Emily, Ranson, and other, you know, everyone, feel free to chime in uh, with additional thoughts, because this is kind of the big question, and it's one that it's really hard to give um, a single answer to because just every organization is has like its current status and those are all different. And so figuring out what's best for one organization could be very different from another. So like, for example, um, before I get into my attempt at some generalization, like we're currently doing with this, this with Noir Lab. So we went in, we did an assessment where we, we basically looked at, here's their cybersecurity program. Here are the 16 musts. Let's do, we do a little bit of like a gap analysis, see where are the, uh, the areas for improvement, and then we gave some recommendations. And now this next six months is very focused on trying to figure out, okay, what do we do first, right? Because if there's a, if there's a number of things you need to deal with, you need a plan, you need to think about it over a longer period of time. And a lot of times, if there are resource constraints, that period of time might be even longer, right? If you just don't have a whole lot of time to dedicate to a project, that's going to impact how long it takes to implement the whole thing. So um, 
this is something that we're, we're struggling with providing uh, just generalized guidance for. But I would say, again, in uh, trying to speak as generally as possible, uh, there are a couple of the musts that we think um, are always useful if you are like an operational. So there's, there's a pretty big distinction between if you're currently like in operations, like you're doing a mission already, and then you're trying to like bring cybersecurity into that, as opposed to if you're in the development phase and you have time, like you don't actually go into operations and you've got three years of lead time. Those two situations are very different and we would approach them very differently with, you know, what do you prioritize first? But um, the uh, selecting a baseline control set, that's uh, must 15, basically just having some external guidance on what are the controls we're selecting, very important. We think that's one that people should generally prioritize if they're not doing it already. Resourcing is always going to be very important. If you do not have like a, a structured way of dealing with resources, that's one you should definitely be prioritizing. And also, um, must one, which is uh, align your uh, program to the organization's mission, uh, is somewhat broadly worded. But if you if you dig a little bit deeper into the fig, we we give a much more specific recommendation, which is uh, create a strategic plan for the program, where you basically are having like an as an organization, you sit down and you think through this the question you kind of asked with your you know your with your team and with your organizational leadership or in the case you highlighted, maybe multiple organizations leadership and basically say, okay, over the next five years, what are we trying to get done and when? And focusing on those really big landmarks. Okay, so like we want to have a cybersecurity lead established. When do we want that to happen? We want to um, have an inventory, like a full inventory of our, of our uh, yeah, information assets. When is that gonna happen? And, but thinking really critically about that, but, um, it's a really tough question. Uh, I hope I gave you a little bit of guidance, but without without you know basically you know we are we have to go in with kind of a team and really live in the environment for a little bit to really give the a very tailored answer to that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. No, I think that was helpful because it, like the divide and conquer approach, like prioritizing some of the musts is the because you know looking at them at, at the list of sixteen seems uh, kind of overwhelming. Um, and so if you pick one or two and kind of get a uh, you know, ease into it and, and then figure out just how much time this is going to take and, and thinking about it at, you know, in terms of, you know, even the, the examples you mentioned, six months plus six months, and then a, you know, two to three year plan is, is also a valuable insight because I didn't know if this was sort of envisioned as something that should be done within six months or you should get a good understanding of within six months. Yeah, that final point is a really good one. I mean, obviously the sooner the better, but we recognize in the real world stuff takes time. And a lot of times it might be, all right, you need six months to figure out how to your how you're going to address the 16. Like that, that's all the first six months is going to be, and that this might be a, a multi-year process, most of most likely. Thank you. And I would add to that, uh, you know, given your situation where you are a, a sub organization or a child organization within, in your case, multiple parent organizations. And I, I referenced this when I was going through my two slides. Uh, a lot of the language, a lot of the considerations presented within the FIG do address your exact situation where you are inheriting or maybe inheriting uh, quite a bit of controls or policy or what have you. And, and as a, a, an operator, um, or a, a member of that, that child organization, uh, there's some pretty keen guidance in, uh, in the uh, framework guide. Thanks, thanks again. I got a question. Um, you kind of discussed a little bit of going from kind of ground zero to some minimal um, state. Have you worked with the opposite direction where perhaps a security team went select star from everything and try to implement the whole thing and trying to right size that into some different kind of uh, state. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I personally have not engaged with anyone with any, uh, any like engagee or target that um, has overdone it, so to speak, most of the time, uh, people might, they might be kind of like sampling from a bunch of different things, but they, they're not like quite drinking from the fire hose as far as it would seem. Um, but uh, Emily or Ranson, if you have, if you have thoughts on that as well. 
feel free to chime in. Uh, yes, I would start with uh, month one, the mission, uh, because that's going to help you determine what's really important, what your organization does, and what it is you really need to protect. So if you're spending money on things that's really outside of your mission, uh, there's a good way to go ahead and, uh, you know, reapportion those resources that are being used for something that you probably don't really need. Um, but as it comes to a minimum standard, uh, what we're talking about, if you answer that must, for example, must, uh, I think it's must six, uh, or must seven a point of cybersecurity lead. Uh, so if you appoint a cybersecurity lead, you have met the standard for that. Um, um, so that's what we're talking about in terms of a minimal uh, standard, just for an example. Yeah, yeah, I think Ransom makes a really good point about like the whole point of the mission pillar is about alignment to the mission, right? We're, we're not trying, we're not pursuing security for the sake of security. We're always doing security for something else. And uh, that that's a point that we make uh, pretty frequently and uh, most of the time on receptive ears. We don't get a whole lot of pushback from that. But um, I, yeah, I think doubling down on, on those mission pillars would probably be a good place to start if you're in a position where people are trying to do too much. Uh, I think the other potential area maybe is in like the control space. Cause most of the time, if people are trying to do too much, they're probably trying to do too many controls because that's what just a lot of cybersecurity is. And that's why we do really say, pick a baseline control set. Uh, we recommend the CIS controls, but for there are a number of reasons why people might be you know, they might go down a different path. They might pick one of the NIST control sets, for instance, um, and follow the control set and have it be prioritized. But, you know, actually having like a pretty clear plan and not just be kind of a grab bag, because um, one of the one of the main things the framework is trying to do is avoid an ad hoc, uh, you know, unconsidered approach to a lot of these things. We want there to be we're, you know, we're, we're putting in processes to make sure that the right people are making the decisions. And so that, another, I guess another one, and this might be the last word that'll be on this because we're almost out of time, is um, I want to say it's must five, but basically bringing in leadership because leadership are probably going to be of the mindset that uh, the cybersecurity thing, it might be important, but it is not, it's not our primary goal, right? You know, we're, if we're Nike, we're making shoes or you know, we're, we have something else we're trying to do and leadership, their, their priority is going to be that and making sure that cybersecurity is not a problem for them. And so if leadership are involved in those really big decisions, then I think that'll help uh, be a natural tamp down on, you know, excessive cybersecurity, so to speak. But again, in general, we haven't seen that a whole lot. <laughs> Good discussion. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for the questions. And, and, and thanks, Scott, Ranson, and Emily for keeping us right on time. So Mark Krenz is up next. So Mark, why don't you go ahead and share your screen? And, and uh, if, if people have uh, continued discussions about the framework, uh, post in the chat. Um, but also, let's give Mark our attention. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Looks good. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about Google Drive and I call this the unknown unknowns because it was a bunch of stuff that we actually discovered just that weren't, wasn't documented very well. <laughs> um, so I'm Mark Krenz. I work at Indiana University where I'm a chief security analyst. I've uh, been part of Trusted CI for the last five years uh, as well. I've been a Linux system administrator for a long time. And I also created Cloud Perm, which is a Google Drive auditing tool that I'll be talking about later. Um, my partner in crime in developing this presentation, but who can't join us because he's doing another presentation, is Ashan Avani. Uh, he works with me on uh, resolving a lot of the Google Drive issues and, and does a lot of the actual operations that we go through um, that I'll be talking about. And he also works at CACR and works for Trusted CI. So if you can imagine for a second, uh, you're in the situation, you know, you share a sensitive file with your close colleagues. Uh, it has medical information in it. Maybe you should or shouldn't be doing this, but anyways, you've, it's something that you've done. Uh, you do this through Google Drive and you think that uh, everything's okay. And then six months later, you look at the permissions and you find that it's been open to the world all this time, or at least it's open to the world now. 
and you find that it's shared so that you know anybody with the link can see this data and it's all this medical data you know with names addresses uh, blood types and, and stuff like that um, oh no the horror without the logs to to check you can't see whether anybody has actually viewed this data or not so you have to assume that it's been viewed by unauthorized people and so this might be the situation that some of us find ourselves in. Uh, we've never had something quite this bad, but you know, I can imagine that there's something like this out there um, that's happened. So the first thing I wanna do is level set everybody uh, as much as I can in the time I have. Um, you may be familiar with Google Drive, but I just wanna bring everybody up to speed. So there are three different types of Google Drive. The first one is the one that you probably you know, use commonly maybe on your personal account. This is, would be where you have you know, a Gmail account, or maybe you have an account that's associated with another email address, but you haven't formed any kind of official contractual relationship with Google Air than their normal terms and conditions. This is normal G, uh, Google Drive. Um, no real protection here than the default protections that they offer. And then you have the G Suite for educate, education and enterprise accounts. Maybe some of you have this at your institutions where your institution has signed a contract with Google for uh, additional protections. And you, know, you have a G Suite administrator who actually uh, has some control over what is um, possible, you know, what plugins you can run and so on. And then on top of that, they have a newer system called Google Shared Drive, which used to be called Team Drive. And this is where uh, the ownership model has changed a little bit. So your project owns the files instead of individuals owning the files. And that way, when people leave, they don't you know, take the files with them. The project retains the ownership of it. Another thing to keep in mind is that Google Drive is an object storage system. It's not a file system hierarchy, although it may look and act sometimes like a file system hierarchy. It is different. It, uh, a file can be in multiple parent directories or folders, whatever you want to call them, and that can affect how things work. Um, your access is based on your email address and whatever your email address uh, how it authenticates with Google Drive, whether that be through your institution and maybe two-factor there, maybe it's just you know, a simple password. Um, and then adding or removing people's access at a higher level, it will propagate down. So if you have like a top level, like you know, trusted CI top level folder, and then folders and files underneath that, adding somebody, uh, giving them access at a high level will propagate down through the lower levels. It'll add them to each of the files and folders in turn. A file is owned by the person who creates it. So uh, this is something to keep in mind when, when, uh, you know, when they leave or, or when the, the project uh, goes away or something like that, is that the people who create stuff are going to own the files. And it may be difficult to actually transfer permissions, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, permissions can be controlled by any editor. So when you're giving somebody edit access, you're giving them the power to actually add more people to uh, the list of people who have permissions. The file owner can prevent this, but it's something that they have to go in and, and uh, go into advanced settings and click a checkbox. Uh, documents and folders can be restricted to just the owner. You can restrict it to people by their email address. You can share it to anybody who has a link to it. And then there was another permission called shared with public, but that's been deprecated and is no longer available, but older files and folders may still be shared this way. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. You may have an older file or folder, but shared with public basically means it's discoverable on a Google search. Um, so they don't have to have the link to the file. Even though sharing a file with a document link um, would make it public to anybody who has that link. Uh, documents can be restricted uh, to, you know, inside of restricted folders can be more permissive. So you can have a file that's within a, a very restricted folder be open to the world through a document link or to the public or something like that. Uh, this is where it's different from a file system hierarchy where like a subfolder would inherit the permissions of its parent folder and so on. And then if you want to transfer uh, ownership of documents, you can only do so between a specific domain. So you can only transfer from like iu.edu to iu.edu or Gmail to Gmail, but you can't go from like Gmail to iu or vice versa or illinois.edu to iu.edu uh, or vice versa. These are just some sample domains. Um, and this is Google's policy. Uh, this isn't something that like your, 
your uh, G Suite administrator controls. This is something that Google controls um, part of their security model. So what are the issues? There's many issues that come up. Um, the first one they'll talk about is sharing with link. So if you share a file uh, by link, and I've seen several people fall into this trap. They, they went to click on get a shareable link and it opened up the file and for folder to uh, anybody who has that link. And then those permissions maybe start propagating down the tree. Those with former access to a uh, folder hierarchy or document are going to still have access to that link when they leave. You know, if you may think that you've offboarded them, but they're going to retain access to it. They may have it in their email. Uh, it could be linked from other documents. Maybe it's linked to from a website or something like that. And somebody's email could be compromised, meaning that the links would be compromised. Um, so sharing a document with link, you have to be really careful um, that it's not being exposed. Uh, there's another feature where you can share a document with a domain, and I'm not going to get into this too much because I consider this an actual vulnerability of the Google Drive permissions model um, because it is discoverable. Uh, unlike when you share something with a link, it's actually possible to find these files within your institution. I'm not going to disclose how that's done, um, but you can search for it yourself. Um, Please be mindful of people's privacy. And there are ways that Google are, is going to fix this in the future, which I'll talk about in a second. So anybody at the institution can see a file that's been uh, shared in this way. Um, at first, I thought that this was just a, um, you know, a way of restricting shared by link with people at your institution, but it turns out it's discoverable. So that's a, that's a major problem. Um, revoking access. So some, when you go to revoke access from somebody from the top of the tree, you know, so we think of it as a file system hierarchy, uh, we might think that it's revoking access from everything beneath, but that's not always 100%. We've run into cases where it uh, removes their access from a handful of files, but not everything. Uh, they still retain access to files that they own, um, you know, and then if they, uh, how do you handle the ownership change? You know, when you're, if you have a multi-institution project, like for instance, Trusted CI is this multi-institution project. How do you handle transferring the files between uh, the different domains? Folders owned by somebody who's left lead to repropagation of their owner of their permissions. So if you don't change the ownership of a folder and somebody leaves, and you've, you know, you've removed their access to all the sub files, they're going to regain access to new files that create underneath that folder. There's also been lots of weird unexplainable problems. This is just a bucket item here. Um, so it's you know, kind of an enigma. Uh, they still know the document URLs when they leave. That's another thing is that you, you can't, uh, you know, they might keep them in bookmarks or something like that, but you just can't assume that they don't have access. Um, here's an example of a folder tree that I've, you know, I've uh, just made this diagram for, and you can imagine that there's different, you know, you can think of a Venn diagram or a Euler diagram, um, and you have different groups. You know, Google doesn't have the concept of defined groups, but you can imagine group A being like the entire team. Maybe group B is like the finance team or, you know, or group C is the finance team, group B is like the marketing team or something like that. And so you've, you've set up your permissions so that you have these teams uh, or these groups. And then you go to give some new user access at the top level folder. And so their permissions propagate down through all the folders and files and they gain access to everything. When you go to remove them, uh, from the top level folder, you may think that it, it removes them because you check a couple files and you say, okay, it's removed them from, from this file. But then for some reason, they've retained access to other files, even ones that they didn't own. Um, you know, for reasons that we can't explain, uh, they retain access to some files. So this is a common situation that I've seen and we've run into with Entrusted CI. Um, Multiple institution uh, problems. So transferring ownership between files uh, won't work. Uh, we do have a solution for that later in these slides, which I'll talk about. Um, some institutions may not use G Suite for education. So you don't have a way of you know, uh, contacting like a G Suite admin. Good luck contacting the Google admin about this, uh, any kind of problems that you have. Um, 
They may have different security policies at the different institutions. Some may allow add-ons, some may not allow add-ons um, for different types of features. Uh, when somebody leaves, you know, have they retained access? I've talked about this before. They still know the URLs. How are you going to transfer ownership? Uh, what if they delete a folder? What if they delete their account? Uh, when somebody leaves, if they delete their account, all their folders and files get um, get removed that they owned. Um, we've tested this. What ends up happening if they own a folder is that all the sub files become orphans, and so you could still find them on a search, but they would they would you know they would no longer be in the hierarchy that you've set up, uh, and you would have to rejoin them to the hierarchy by locating all of them and stuff. Um, some projects may have a lot of files. Trusted CI alone has over 10,000 files in Google Drive. So trying to tackle this uh, manually is just you don't have enough time. Um, and I've been on several projects where they have thousands of files. So you, know, you probably have a lot more files than you think. What about ransomware? This is an error question that's come up. Some people have their uh, Google Drive mounted through something like Google Drive Sync or FileStream. FileStream can be thought of as something like NFS or SSHFS if you've ever used that. Uh, Google Drive Sync will try to download files as you use them and stuff like that. So is that, attack is that an attack vector? And the answer is yes. Uh, if you're using one of these technologies and your client host gets infected with ransomware, it will encrypt the files. Um, doc versions may save you. We found cases where this will actually save you. You can go back through previous doc, document versions, but this is highly dependent on how the ransomware actually works. Some ransomware may delete files before it recreates a new file with the, um, with the encrypted content. And when it does that, it loses all the metadata, including previous versions. So you're not gonna be able to get back uh, previous versions like that. Um, you could pot potentially set up honeypot files, you know, and maybe one called A, one called Z, one called M or something like that to catch different uh, cases of ransomware starting at different points. Uh, and you could detect when they get encrypted and send you an alert and then try to track down whose uh, account has been compromised or something like that. Um, so some solutions, um, auditing permissions. So if you have a G Suite administrator at your institution, I would encourage you to get to know who they are, uh, try and build a relationship with them so that when you actually come across a problem, you can contact them and maybe they can help. Uh, they can do special things. They can recover files. They can um, move files around. They can't transfer ownership between domains though. Uh, and there's some things that they aren't able to do. They also have a special tool that they can get access to called GAM. Uh, G Suite administrative something. Anyways, um, so that's a special tool that they can use for uh, doing a lot of things in bulk. Um, and if you're a G Suite admin, I'd encourage you to check this out. Another solution would be to use a G uh, a G Doc add-on, so a Google Documents add-on. Um, this wouldn't require API access, at, but you would need to have the permission to be able to install add-ons. Just keep in mind that you're granting some developer access to your stuff. And this is you know, a showstopper for a lot of people. It's a showstopper for Trusted CI. And that's why we developed our own. And so this one does not require you know, administrator access. It does require API access. So if you're not able to use uh, an API, uh, then you're not going to be able to use it, unfortunately. But if you are able to use an API, uh, you can install this tool that um, you have to go through a process of authenticating yourself. And then it'll print out uh, like the permissions um, to a file. And then you can use that for actually going in and, and checking uh, are any of the files open to the world by link and so on. More information is available at this, at this URL. So this is a program I wrote, it's constantly getting better. Uh, it's still kind of in beta, but it works for us uh, pretty well. And we've, we've used it to save ourselves a few times. Um, setting policy, this is another thing that we've done. If you happen to look at the folder that we've given you access to, it has a tag at the top that's public. Actually, it should be shared dash email, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, but anyways, putting tags into uh, full, you know, files and folder file names so that you can 
uh, indicate what the sharing intent was is good. Um, we, we have requirements for you know, your authentication. Like we say, you have to have two-factor authentication. Uh, you have to have restrictions on add-ons. Um, you can have restrictions on mounting and syncing software. Like on Trusted CI, we don't allow that. Um, by policy, we can't, in, unfortunately, we can't enforce it, but uh, we check with our staff and we educate our staff about it. Um, and then we have these tags. Uh, coming down the line in September or October, I think there's there's a new solution that Google is going to have for um, requiring that if a file is shared with link, that the person viewing it has to make a request to be able to uh, see the file, and the person who owns that will receive this request and grant permission to it. This may become kind of annoying for people who are sharing with a lot of people, but there's apparently there's going to be an ability to opt out. And it's unclear, you know, how this is going to work, how annoying it might be, or, or whatever. But this probably will solve some of the issues that we've had with sharing of uh, files with the public uh, when it's not intended. Backing up Google Drive, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that when deleted files uh, are deleted, they're gone after 20 or 30 days, and they can't be recovered. Um, they may go unnoticed that they've been deleted, um, and then you might run into uh, uh, issues where you can't actually back up Google Drive through the UI because they have a two gigabyte limit. Um, so you might use one of these tools, Google Camel Fuse or Rclone, to be able to uh, do this from like a Linux host or a Windows host so you can kind of do it through the API. And when you test the process of, uh, you want to test the pro restoration process, do it to an alternate location and also keep in mind that when you, if you were to grant access to people in that alternate location, it's going to, the files are going to show up when they do a search. So you may not want to grant them access right away uh, when you're doing this test um, so that they don't end up editing the wrong file or something like that. Okay, Google Shared Drive. Uh, this is a better solution. I'm just going to leave some of these notes here. You'd want to start with this uh, if you can. Uh, the drive owns the file, so you don't have to deal with ownership problems. Uh, it solves many of the permission issues that you might have. Cross-domain file ownership transfer. It is actually possible. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have too much time to talk about this, but there is a link here that explains how to do it. And here's some general steps on how to do it. Um, unfortunately, permissions won't be preserved, but you can you know, fix those later. And if you have questions or comments, you're welcome to contact uh, Sean or myself. Here's our email addresses. And thank you for attending. And with that, I'll ask if anybody has any questions right on the nose <laughs> of the time, right? Perfect. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. I mean, how many NSF research projects are using Google Drive? It's got to be a huge percentage. So it's really important cyber infrastructure. Uh, so if you have a question, please unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask um, or um, post in the chat. Okay, how often you want to do an audit for all the accounts in Excel? Once, once a month. So we have this as part of our um, ISO teams project plan. We do the, uh, we run the cloud perm auditing script once a month. And, um, and then we do backups once a month. Um, backups have been a little bit trickier uh, in that if you have large video files, uh, those can those can kind of um, it can choke on those. So I've ended up uh, the way I do the backups is I just run a tar command uh, using this Google Camel Fuse, and I just skip like MP4 files and move files and stuff like that. So uh, I do a backup without backing up the videos. Anything larger than like a gigabyte or maybe 500 megabytes is going to be problematic. Um, but essentially, we do this once a month. Other questions? Well, I might have one, one uh, related to the first one. Is uh, you're running your stuff, you're, you're doing the checks every month, and then I'm assuming that you can put the output and say spreadsheet or something so you can keep track of the trends and stuff. So to look for anomalies. Right. So Right now, the output is, is kind of meant to be processed by command line tools, and, and we're working on improving that. 
uh, Ashan, what he does is he takes the output of it and he puts it into a spreadsheet and then he searches for cases where it gives a warning about something being shared unintentionally. And also we use it for checking when somebody leaves to make sure that we've removed their access from all the files that they're, they're supposed to um, have had their access removed. Um, so we do this, we, you know, we kind of, it's a manual process right now. We're looking at improving this so that we can receive like automated alerts and also so that we can run it in real time so that um, it's constantly getting the new data and then uh, it can alert us when something has been misshared in real time. Um, but that's you know kind of a future improvement and we just haven't had a lot of time for, for working on this. Um, I could jump in really quickly. I've actually used uh, Cloud Perm with uh, some command line solutions where I've been able to produce a report to see which of our files which should not have been shared publicly were and I basically uh, uh, you know pull down the the cloud perm results, get the file ID, translate it, and then be able to to produce some human readable uh, information uh, to which I port it out into a, a text document uh, for delivery. So so it can be done, and it actually is super duper useful. It's a wonderful wonderful tool, and it's not just because I I know Mark to you know give him some props. It really is it is a great tool. I di I didn't pay for this endorsement. <laughs> Hi, Mark, it's Tom, Mark, good to see you. Um, I wonder, you didn't have a chance to talk about the method for transferring ownership from one organization to another. Do you think you could take some of the Q&A time and show us that? Right, so um, let me just reshare this slide here. So uh, it wasn't Google who published this, it was published by some blog. Um, basically what you do is it uses, so it requires Google shared drive, first of all. Um, so you have to have access to Google shared drive. If you don't at your institution, this isn't going to work. Uh, the from owner moves the files into Google shared drive. So they would, they would do a search for the files that they want to move or go to a folder. And then they would, uh, basically use the Google user interface for, for moving them into the shared drive location. Then the receiving owner, so, so let's say that you had somebody who left your project. They would do the first process, these first two steps. Uh, you know, they would need to have access to Google Share Drive. They would move the files that they own into Google Share Drive. The receiving owner, uh, which would be somebody on your IT staff or ISO staff, uh, would transfer the files back into, location, uh, into uh, the folder where they're supposed to go. And the receiving owner would actually end up owning the files. And the receiving owner could be on a different domain name uh, if, you know, if that's what you need. Um, stuff like, um, yeah, so metadata comments versions and document ID are preserved. So this is often an important thing, like a document ID, if you publish that in some way, you might need to preserve that. So this preserves that, which is a, a nice thing. The problem is, is that the folder locations aren't preserved and folders aren't preserved. So you have to transfer individual files um, one at a time or in bulk, uh, but it has to be just files. Also, the permissions aren't preserved, except for when you put them back into place, they'll inherit the permissions of like the top level folder or the parent folder that you're putting them into. Now, as part of Cloud Perm, one thing that I'm working on, I have been able to get working as a prototype is an automated way of putting the files back into the place where they used to be prior to uh, moving them into Google Shared Drive. So eventually uh, we'll be able to um, take care of the uh, folders, you know, the hierarchy being restored. Um, I just haven't had a lot of time to actually work on it. Um, so yeah, that's coming down the line. So if you're in this situation now, there is a solution. It, it requires a lot of manual work. Um, but hopefully we'll have an automated solution soon. Thanks, I look forward to the automated solution uh, at some point. NSF, if you're listening, if you could give us like some more money to... <laughs> so <we> can... <laughs> Any other questions?
Don't be shy. <laughs> we have three minutes. Is there any type of output format? Let me ask the question of the community. Is there any type of output format that you'd appreciate it, um, Cloud Perm um, saving to? I'd say either CSV or YAML kind of thing. Okay, CSV, YAML. CSV is one that we've added. Uh, and I think the, the, yeah, the GitHub repo actually has that code. Um, YAML is a new one I hadn't thought of. Uh, one of the other ones that we're uh, trying to output to is JSON and also to a SQLite database. Um, basically, the way the newer version of CloudPerm is going to work is it writes everything to an SQLite database. And then from there, it'll output stuff to, you know, the different formats that you might want. But I'll keep YAML in mind. There was just one thing I was going to say that, you know, probably I'm assuming that you're going to be running this into a machine that you can trust because uh, you feel like there's a lot of information there that can get uh, privacy people excited. Yep, exactly. So even we even consider file names to be sensitive. Um, metadata and file names, people's email addresses, I consider that to be a sensitive uh, matter. So um, yeah, the way we've set this up is we have a special virtual machine that's running in the cloud that only does, um, that only runs cloud perm and only does the backups and we've restricted access to that machine. So it's not running like on our workstations or you know something that a lot of people have access to. And we require two-factor authentication to get into it. So when we think about this setup, we, we consider what our trusted CI policies are for data management. We make sure that it aligns with that. Because even a file name can be, you know, reveal a lot about what's going on. Um, and even people's email addresses, you know, can can reveal a lot. So thanks for that point. Not running off a library computer, yeah. So I, I take it by the questions that you you're all kind of experiencing similar issues. If you're if you think that you don't have an issue, I'd encourage you to check out your Google Drive permissions because you probably do have an issue and you don't even realize it. So with that, I'll just say thank you and I'll pass the torch on to the next person. Thanks, Mark. Uh a lot of good uh, practical details there. Uh, really appreciate it. So uh, next up, we have a presentation about Custos. And um, uh, let's see who, uh, we've got quite a few co-presenters. Who's going to do the sharing? I'll do, I'll do the sharing. Too. All right, go for it, Marlon. All right. And good morning, everyone. So I don't know if uh, if you ask lots of questions, if you, if you can increase your position in the leaderboard or not. I'm still trying to figure out how how the uh, uh, how to game this. Anyway, I don't. I wonder are there any prizes also. Anyway, all right. So good morning. We have a cast of thousands um, on this uh, presentation. So it's experiences integrating and operating custom security services. And uh, so I'm Arlen Pierce. Uh, uh, a lot of the work uh, that I'm going to be describing here was done by uh, Asuru Ranawaka with uh, with help from uh, Demuthu and implementation and uh, uh, Suresh and architecture and design of uh, the system. Uh, Smitha and, and uh, Marie Ma here are colleagues from Hathi Trust Research Center. I'll say more about that in a minute. And we're doing this in partnership with uh, Ennis and his colleagues at the Galaxy Project and. Jim and his uh, team there on the CI logon project. So uh, if you want to get much more detail uh, about um, some of the topics I'm going to cover here, we have a, a preprint uh, available from uh, this URL, which uh, you can find by, among other things, going to uh, Google Scholar and looking for, uh, say, my name or other Jim's name is other people in, in the Custos project. So this presentation, a lot of it is based on uh, on that uh, on that document. And also, um, we'll 
have a full three hour or half day tutorial coming up today from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern time or noon to 3 p.m. Pacific time. And so uh, again, much more detail and, and maybe some things that didn't come up in these use cases will be covered in that I'm gonna talk about today will be covered in uh, the tutorial. So you can get full hands-on experience uh, with a service using a sample web client. And also with, uh, uh, you can uh, take a dive into the API using a hosted Jupyter Notebook. So um, if these topics are of interest to you, please come to the tutorial. Uh, things are all set up so that you don't have to, uh, uh, you can dive right in and start using stuff in a sandbox and uh, you don't have to worry about uh, getting anything installed locally unless you want to. Right. Okay, so what is Custos? It's an open source security middleware uh, for Science Gateway. So we particularly are interested in Science Gateway usage scenarios, which we'll cover in the presentation. And uh, this um, open source software is something that we operate as a service for, uh, for gateways out of um, the IU Cyber Infrastructure Integration Research Center, which is uh, the team that Asuru and Suresh and I and others are on uh, at IU. We're an NSF funded project. Uh, we have an active award in case you're wondering about the 18. We're in our no cost extension year beginning uh, August 1st. And our big push and among other things, our big push in this last year is to uh, identify a lot of um, uh, early adopters uh, who want to uh, see what we're doing here in this presentation, the tutorial, other, other venues, and, uh, and try out what we're doing. And so what we're doing also as part of uh, overall project on our team called the Science Gateways Platform as a Service. Uh, so just as, a, uh, just as a point of information, the uh, stuff that we're doing is separate from, but dependent, but embedded in our platform. So. Uh, just because the project is NSF funded and, and we'll have a, an end date at some point doesn't mean that the service ends, but rather what we build is uh, working its way into our, um, our production. So what are the features? Uh, so first and foremost, so again, these are driven by our experiences with our collective experiences on the team with working with gateways. And so uh, first and foremost is uh, is authentication. So federated authentication, of course, is uh, something that we uh, do in partnership with the CI Logon project, where you can uh, essentially, through API calls and integration, uh, have your gateway integrated with your own campus authentication system, or or your um, if you have users from many different universities or many different uh, locations, they can. Uh, use their own identity provider, or rather authentication provider. Uh, user management, of course, is the next step. So uh, this builds on uh, open source software called Keycloak that we integrate into our stack. So uh, uh, the next step is then you have, so you've authenticated, you have uh, identity and accounts and so forth. Uh, next step is you know, what are you allowed to do? And so that's authorization, of course. And so we have uh, a few different flavors of authorization, role-based authorization, which might be assigned to you uh, by the gateway administrator, uh, group-based authorization, which is a little bit more freewheeling. So uh, ordinary users can create and manage uh, groups and manage sharing within a, a gateway. And then lastly is attribute-based authorization, which uh, we'll show demos of uh, in the tutorial. So building on that, the next step is, uh, you know, so you're in a group or you have a role or whatever, what are you actually allowed to do? Uh, so, uh, so how can you, if you create a digital object essentially in a gateway, can you, can you share it? And what permissions do the people have that you're sharing it with? How can you control those permissions? Um, the next layer down, which is 
can be something that a user will bring will bring to a gateway, but it can also be something that the gateway uh, will want to provide itself, which is uh, resource credentials management or secrets management. And so uh, that means if, from a gateway point of view, if you're integrating with, let's say, uh, Xpans or Bridges2 or Stampede2 or whatever uh, gateways or your local gateway, how do you uh, how how do you manage those uh, connections where they where the gateway might be uh, running a running a uh, a job on that machine on the queuing system? So there's a resource credential there, which is a uh, public and private key pairs, but also more and more, especially as Jim and colleagues try and move the community forward is the, you know, it's moving towards things like access tokens, so off to access tokens and things like that. So those are examples of, of uh, secrets that a gateway might provide, but also users may need to bring their own secrets. So they want to bring their own uh, access to a, uh, a database that they're using, uh, a third party, a third party service or um, their own uh, external storage or whatever. Lastly is tenant management, which I'll, uh, I'll just say, we, we run middleware, we think of all the clients as tenants. Uh, clients don't think of themselves as tenants, they think they get everything, uh, but really it's one consolidated middleware that uh, all of the, um, uh, that all the different tenants are using. But we're seeing also, and we go into more detail about this in the paper, that there are tenant scenarios for clients. So I may be running a gateway, but I may actually have sub gateways, or I may be running a platform uh, for lots of other different gateways. And so I essentially have my own tenants. So you can uh, use Custos to organize and manage your, your own tenants if you're uh, one of our tenants. Okay. Internal architecture, it was a picture I won't dive into it uh, in detail other than to say Custos was born out of Apache Arvatha and our experiences doing stuff, but it's a completely new rewrite of all of the services so, which Asuru has undertaken. And so uh, it gave us an opportunity, Apache Arvatha code base, although it's evolved constantly, it goes back a decade and a lot of things have happened. So this gave us an opportunity to look at uh, how to build new systems from scratch using containers uh, uh, container management systems like Kubernetes and uh, um, other um, interesting technologies like Rancher, Envoy, and and uh, and other service mesh technologies. So uh, basically, Custos uh, we built it as as a modern microservice based system. All right, so. That's the Custos introduction overview. Let's look at some of the uh, examples that we have. So of, of client integration. So the first is Galaxy. So NS Afghan is a co-PI on the project. You know, they have a lot of um, interesting requirements. We wanted Custos from the beginning to uh, not be just the thing for our Vatha gateways, but a thing that's relevant for a wide range of uh, potential clients who maybe have their own solutions for data management or for running workflows and things like that, but they find it useful to take some of those security pieces and use those as an external service. Uh, so the first step, which we completed and which part of the Galaxy uh, uh, current release is uh, support for federated authentication. So users can use Custos uh, to authenticate out of the box. That's uh, available uh, for download and uh, is or will be part of uh, the Galaxy main uh, deployment. So you can see an example of how all that works, how, how to set it up if you're a Galaxy user, or I mean, a, if you run Galaxy, you can see how to set all that up at our tutorial uh, this afternoon. In the in-progress thing, the, the work we're in the middle of is support for secrets which is to allow users to store uh, sensitive data or rather to allow users to bring, sensitive might be a uh, overloaded term here, uh, but to bring their own data 
uh, without storing any sensitive information directly in Galaxy. So rather to outsource that to something that specializes in, in storing secrets. So uh, the general path or phase, and, and I'd like to thank Ennis for the last couple of slides, is uh, to add ability for users to use tools uh, that require some authentication outside of Galaxy. So you can store the user's credentials in Vault. So we use Hathi, uh, HashiCorp's Vault for secrets management. Uh, enable OIDC and OAuth based handshakes uh, via tokens and, and explore support for access to, uh, uh, to data sets that users might bring to, uh, to Galaxy that Galaxy doesn't want to directly, directly manage. So again, I'd like to modify a little bit here uh, on the fly to say that um, these data sets, we don't think of Custos at this point as being something uh, our target is for open scientific research, uh, which still needs uh, uh, security as the trusted CI uh, team has argued uh, uh, persuasively in the past. So the ultimate um, end goal of, of this, which we would like to uh, you know, explore with the uh, Galaxy team is unifying multiple deployments of Galaxy. So Galaxy is software, you can download it and run it, but also uh, there's a big deployment called the Galaxy Main or Use Galaxy, as uh, Use Galaxy for the European Union and a Use Galaxy for, uh, for Australia, uh, maybe some others, maybe some other large institutional level galaxies. How do, you, how do you begin to think about how users can more easily move between, uh, between those different deployments? So uh, those are, things that the custom services uh, uh, could potentially enable. Okay, my second uh, use case is for Hathi Trust and the Hathi Trust Research Center. So uh, Hathi Trust is a not-for-profit collaborative of academic and research libraries for many millions of digitized items, some of which are in the public domain and some of which are not. They still have copyrights attached to them. So it may not be immediately obvious, but HTRC and, and the Research Center and Hathi Trust main are uh, sibling organizations, maybe a little sister, big sister, but they're sibling organizations and they have different infrastructures and different gateways, different gateway front ends. Uh, HTRC is there as the name implies, it's, they look at how to build new tools and provide new capabilities and they're also there for people who uh, need to do more complicated uh, research uh, research efforts on the Hathi Trust uh, corpus than the main site's going to support. So uh, basically HTRC provides intermediate and advanced analytic under the tools for the collection. So the first problem we helped with worked with the HTRC and HT teams on is uh, unifying their authentication for the HTRC gate analytics gateway. So the picture looks like this, the paper preprint uh, walks through the steps. But basically the, the thing here was that um, after some uh, discussions with the Hathi Trust team and how to, how to do this, we uh, landed upon uh, using Open Athens Open ID Connect provider, which we can then configure Custos to work work with. The reason we did this was that um, CI logon worked with the majority of of users, and they could just log in that uh, with their institutional credentials. But there were a handful of university partners of Hathi Trust who were not or who were not uh, in part of in common. They weren't available through CI logon. Uh, the path uh, again for that was uh, after some discussions uh, for uh, Hathi Trust, again the main the main institution to uh, uh, to provide an Open ID Connect uh, service for us to to uh, to uh, connect to with uh, Custo. So that's uh, essentially a plugin uh, a plugin for us. All right. So problem number. Two is a little bit more interesting and or complicated. 
and I'll defer to the paper uh, for a more complete description. But Hathi Trust, again, you might notice a the theme here is like, let's do federated authentication first and then let's start seeing what else we can do. Because again, we're not here just to be sitting in front of CI logon or, uh, or uh, providing just federated authentication, but once we have that, what other types of things can we begin to enable gateways to do? Uh, so the second problem again is providing what we call service accounts for uh, data capsules. The idea with HTRC is that uh, there's a gateway, is an analytics gateway you can go and you can use a web browser to run the analytics tools. Um, but a lot of research or advanced researchers are going to want to, you know, they're power users, they're going to want to do their own things, they're going to want to provide, or they're going to want to use more uh, advanced tools in ways that's hard to um, predict ahead of time and encapsulate in a user inter a web interface. So uh, HTRC provides a, a thing called a data capsule that allows users to have to basically load up uh, parts of the corpus onto a virtual, a secured virtual machine along with some analytics tools. And then uh, once everything is set up to lock it down so that, uh, so that um, as they argued in papers, uh, they are protecting the intellectual property or copyrights of, of the publications while still allowing, still allowing the advanced uh, analytics research on the, on the data, on the text. So what we implemented here uh, with them is a, essentially a, a support for their token service uh, to uh, use not just the uh, traditional OAuth 2 web flow, but also to, and there's more detail here than I'll go into, but to also enable a client credential uh, token flow. Okay. Uh, the last scenario, which is, I'll, I'll just touch on at a high level is the um, securing what I call gateway agents. So gateways, you can think of these things as web interfaces to uh, scientific data and scientific software, high performance computers. So they can run completely separate from those resources. They can run on middleware, might be installed on Amazon cloud or whatever and talk to, um, talk to your campus computing. Um, that's one mode. Also other gateways, some, some gateways do that. Other gateways run directly on the resource and they have direct access through installation to the file system and to the um, schedulers and so forth. Um, but what we're seeing is that there is actually a mixture of both. So a, a couple of quick terms here. There's a consolidated middleware. That, that part is a uh, what I'll, the part that runs separately from the resource, I'll call the middleware. And the part that runs on the resource, I'll call agents. And so you actually are familiar with these things. I already showed you a few slides about the data capsules. Uh, Galaxy Pulsar is a way for Galaxy to run jobs on remote resources. Uh, Globus does these sorts of things for file transfer. And Arvatha has managed file transfer as a is an effort that we have uh, to build out uh, uh, agents that can uh, help us do more, uh, have more low level control over file transfer. Hey Marlon, one minute warning. Okay. So very briefly, uh, the idea is again, it's gonna be tied to OAuth to um, client credential flows and how those access tokens wind up on an agent. So, there's a lot more, this is just a placeholder or, or a pointer to the uh, paper where we go into more detail. So my last uh, couple of slides, we're looking for early adopters uh, to build on those use cases that we've seen so far. And so the uh, thing that we're doing if you're an early adopter is um, providing master information security policy and procedures, which we worked out with Susan Sons and the trusted CI team. Uh, so this is a public document that defines the roles and responsibilities, uh, primarily information security officer, uh, who uh, to contact if you're a user or if you're a resource provider or a gateway provider, and a risk management process, which we based on uh, our experiences with Exceed and the Science Gateways Community Institute. So 
So thank you very much. Again, you want to know a lot more detail about things, uh, please come to our tutorial this afternoon. Great. Thanks, Marlon. Um, so we have about eight minutes for questions. I know science gateways are a real important topic for, to, for us this week. So if you have questions, please unmute and go ahead and ask. Well, Marlon, while people are thinking of questions, um, and if you're having trouble unmuting, please uh, please go ahead and post in the chat. Um, uh, let me ask one question. I, I think there's a boff coming up on Wednesday about uh, science gateway security and access topics. Um, you want to give us a preview of the uh, of the discussion that'll happen at that boff? Um, yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Jim, uh, for the opportunity. To, uh, so Jim and I and, and others are co-organizing that boff, and so. Uh, the basic idea is to, um, among other things, uh, we feel like um, there's a lot of um, uh, diversity of ways of running gateways and of how gateways are accessed to resources and how uh, maybe uh, some resource providers, HPC providers may have questions about what's the best way to do something or they may have concerns about um, running a gateway and would like to know what the best practices are. And likewise, what gateways need to know how gateways should think about security from their point of view of, of uh, the resource providers themselves. And so, um, so the BOF is to begin to, uh, is to kick off this working group that we're organizing as part of Trusted CI and, and the Gateway Institute and uh, begin to collect this information, collect some use cases, and use those as the, uh, collect some surveys, I should say, and begin to use those as ways for um, uh, building some best practice recommendations. So probably is not one size fits all. We'll probably find several different modes um, of uh, several different uh, best practice cases, but we'd like to capture those. And I'll say, if you're on the campus champions mailing list, there's been a lot of, it was a revived discussion over just last couple of days about uh, VPNs and uh, two-factor authentication and other sorts of requirements like that. So um, it, it's basically directly aligned with, from the resource provider, those sorts of questions. I see Ryan is unmuted. Ryan, do you have a question for Marlon? Uh, no, not right now. Okay, thanks. Uh, but okay, I see in the chat, Mauricio has a question. Uh, you want to unmute and ask the question, Mauricio? Okay. Uh, well, I was th thinking about it at, because you no, know, you're kind of you know transferring some of the process out, you know, using someone else to do the verif verify the authentication and everything else. But are you still able to pull out some uh, information so you can throw in your logs right. regarding uh, who who has logged in, where they're coming from? Because you no, know, if you also decide, oh, I need to kick out this person, and then that person to log in. Are you asking from the point of view, our point of view, how much yes. do we capture? Yes. So or you much. can capture. Not saying necessarily you capture, but you are able to capture. Yeah. Yeah. So I, and that's for the authentication portion. So, uh, Sue, I'll, I'll, uh, or Suresh, I'll, uh, ask you to queue up to answer this in detail, but yeah, it's, it's basically however much, um, we can, however much is returned by, uh, CI log on, if that's the, if that's the process, if, if that's the authenticator that we use. And so we can, because Jim's on the team, we might be able to, to work with him to and, and his team to expose more information uh, securely, but um, yeah, you don't necessarily have that uh, if you're using if you if you're using another another OIDC provider entirely, then then we may not uh, we may not capture all of that. 
Uh, so Suresh or Asur, can you uh, can you do, have you guys expand on that? Yep, sure. Thanks, man. And so I think it, there's also a part of the question where, like, you know, you we're talking about blocking a user, or let's say, like, you know, between a gateway, if I understood it correctly, um, for uh, if you'd like to stop the user from further using the services, yeah, that's possible because of this multi-level uh, layers, like right? as Marlon described, there are redirects going on um, from the customer services, which is essentially hosting a key cloak at that part uh, for that authentication piece. That's a layer, uh, and then it's happening at the CI logon, and CI logon could uh, do something, and then there's institution. So there are multiple places. It's actually uh, where we need to discuss a little more details and on what you might see or, or what level you would like to block that and what happens and why and so on. So to answer it more precisely, but there are all these places and all these places, there are opportunities to do that. And then finally, I would like to add that. So there's also the step where um, the gateway or any service which integrates can let the authentication happens and block at authorization level. Like, you know, yeah, the user logs in, but cannot do much. You can just control it that those are the capabilities which Marlon was describing when he was describing those role-based or group-based authorizations. So you could build your services such that an authenticated user just provides the information about the user, but to do any further operation, they need to be authorized. And there are all those couple of authorization mechanisms where you could uh, filter out users, uh, both like in a whitelist or blacklist based upon your use cases. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, and you saw in chat, but Jim has a, a pointer to, uh, to to guidelines for uh, for that sort of information. So uh, I know Jim's probably using a lot of that internally in CI Logon. So I guess that's a good point here is that we need to also look at this for uh, what we get downstream from customs or in customs. Yeah, it's definitely true with using federated authentication that you have to work together with all the with the parties who are involved in the in the authentication during a security incident. But I think that's true in cyber infrastructure in general. If uh, you've got Exceed connecting supercomputers and, and data resources together, or other uh, other distributed computing experiments involved in um, uh, in supporting our researchers, um, incidents can can touch multiple organizations, and so we all have to have good working relationships and uh, as part of our incident response. One, we got time for one more question. I, I, I do have a question. What's the, so what was the solution or workaround to um, headless authentication through this federation model? Um, can I say read the paper uh, or come to the tutorial? That's uh, I think we're exactly out of time. Saved by the bell, but that was, um, I think that was your securing remote gateway agents topic, Marlon? Uh, yeah, I, I think, or else, or else the um, uh, Hathi Trust Research Center topic. Yeah, so, uh, so Ryan, you know how to reach us and uh, Saru uh, can tell you in great detail uh, how, how he implemented all that. And also, and also the discussions that we had with um, uh, for HCRC with with the HCRC team and, and internally with uh, Demuthu, who's uh, uh, implementing the MFT service. Great, thanks very much, uh, Marlon, and, and thanks everyone for your questions. We're now going to take a, a nine minute break, um, so we'll be back at nine fifty a.m. Pacific to uh, to continue about NSF and NIH and Incom and two presentations coming up after the break. Thanks. Welcome back, everyone. And um, our next presenter is NS Afghan, talking about parallels uh, and synergies with NSF and NIH. Yeah. Um, so I basically wanted to largely kind of open this um, up for kind of discussion and present it somewhere um, where relevant audience would be present because. 
um, as we'll see in the next few slides, I feel like um, there's this lack of communication between some of these NSF and NIH funded projects. And um, with the Galaxy specifically, we are fortunate enough to sit in kind of both sides. The unfortunate um, um, element of this is that we oftentimes find ourselves having to implement two technologies or two solutions, even though there's a lot of overlap. And so I really kind of want to give some examples and open this up for some ideas um, because ultimately, um, I, um, well, I, I am, I'm certainly not an expert in cybersecurity, but um, we've tried uh, on a number of occasions. We have a difficult time hiring people in this space. And as a sizable project, um, doing work in this domain is, is, um, is very slow and challenging. And so let's see how can we leverage the cybersecurity communities that already exist and seemingly so on, on two fronts. So with that, I'm going to start with a couple of uh, sort of examples. Uh, so when you type in Anvil as, um, as a word into one of these search engines, and I put the image screenshots here because they all depict what the, what these search engines think I'm looking for. And um, none of these have anything to do with cybersecurity or cyber infrastructure in general. However, if you uh, scroll along uh, the result pages, things start to change a little bit. And so the first one around is um, there is this um, project called NIH Anvil. And we are a, um, one of the, the two partners uh, or top level partners. And the idea is to, in this project, is to set up a um, national or not like worldwide infrastructure, cloud based infrastructure for that combines applications um, and infrastructure and data and allow researchers to run these analyses that are otherwise either difficult or impossible to do on uh, their local infrastructures. So, you know, here they have an acronym and, um, and so we ended up with, um, with Anvil. So in his example of when I saw this in the news, I was like, really, of all the words in the world, um, the NSF has to come up with a sizable project of their own called exactly, uh, exactly the same, uh, which, you know, superficially or whatnot, but it just introduces some uh, confusion uh, on the user's part that uh, why do we now have two anvils uh, that originally as a word sort of says had nothing to do with cybersecurity infrastructure and all that, but that's a naming thing. We know all uh, naming is difficult. So I guess the, you know, that being a, a sort of motivational example, um, I'm gonna talk a little more about uh, the use cases that we within Galaxy have and have seen and how can these communities um, kind of maybe help us solve this a little more efficiently. And uh, Marlon mentioned Galaxy in, in the Custis talk, um, but I wanted to take a step back and uh, say a couple of words about Galaxy because this is again a community maybe where Galaxy doesn't get mentioned very frequently. Um, so overall, Galaxy is a uh, data analysis platform. It's been around for 15 years. It originated in genomics and uh, providing tools for analyzing next generation sequencing data. But um, especially over the last two to three years, it has matured and uh, sort of uh, adopted a much more broader approach to data analysis. So it's no longer focused on genomics, but there are plenty of examples out there of Galaxy being used in domains such as uh, machine learning, natural language processing, ecology, uh, climate. And, and at this point, uh, we think of it as a data analysis platform. Uh, and a very unique element of Galaxy is that it has a very uh, sizable and active worldwide community of software engineers, administrators, trainers, and, and users that count in uh, tens of thousands. Um, <clears throat> and, and so with that, we have this very um, diverse um, space in which the application operates and very diverse set of needs from the users that consume it and that use it. And so a couple of use cases that have emerged in this space is um, are, are the following. So one is 
sort of the need, again, Arlen kind of mentioned this, is the need for uh, federated identity. Um, Hughes Galaxy Star, as we refer to this, is global infrastructure that's been managed by Galaxy Project and partners um, that have adopted Galaxy at a, at a large scale. So what used to be just one Galaxy server in the world called uh, Galaxy Main, available at usegalaxy.org, um, has now kind of sprawled into this usegalaxy.star infrastructure and um, a number of institutions or I want to say countries, maybe even around the world, uh, have set up their own use galaxy servers. So we have usegalaxy.au, um, the org.au for Australia, .eu for Europe. Uh, there's one in Norway, there's one in um, uh, France, there's one in Belgium, and, and several more that are emerging around the world in, uh, and should be online in the next few months. And as, as you might imagine, as a user, they see this as a very desirable capability where you, depending on where you are, um, you're able to use more or less the same uh, application. But uh, the problem is that as they jump between one application to, or one server to the other, they're, everything that they, they created on one is completely uh, locked. I mean, everything is locked down to the instance where they created it. And so as a first step towards sort of bridging this and making this be perceived as one uh, global infrastructure, uh, we, we can start with uh, identity and user management, allowing the users to uh, be treated as one and the same person or one and the same identity across all these uh, Galaxy instances. And so in this space, um, as I said, um, you know, we being uh, sort of straddling the NIH and the NSF domains uh, have, have come to at least these two, deal with at least these two projects. So um, NSF Custos, as we just seen Marlon talk about it, it's a managed service for um, handling user identities and authentication, uh, offering secrets management, um, group management, uh, allowing users to sort of uh, deal with permissions and all that Mark uh, talked about to some degree within, in our case would be Galaxy, but um, within the, the kind of data objects space. And then um, something that we talked about on the Custos project side is that uh, the availability of the authentication logs for services for auditing, something that can be kind of difficult to obtain elsewhere. Uh, and so if we kind of take take the, the capabilities of Custos and map those onto the NIH side. Um, a couple of years ago, NIH started this project called the Research for Authentication Service. And the goal is for the NIH to offer this service for uh, its employees and researchers um, to facilitate easier access to controlled data sets that NIH um, has produced. And so the, the, the NIH RAS handles things like authentication and authorization to the data, um, as well as logging and auditing. Um, and it's using uh, OIDC and OAuth standards to do so. Um, it is operated at BISMA high compliance level. So something that, that's very difficult to obtain and, and certainly uh, acts as a differentiator between uh, Custis, for example, and RAS. And then because of its application, uh, in in the medical domain, uh, it it has it implements support for uh, GA4 GH or uh, passports and visas, and I'll talk about that uh, a bit more in a second. But you know what I'm saying here is, I guess, is that uh, there's a lot of parallels here, and, and seemingly um, having to sort of interface with both uh, ends up boiling down to a, a decent amount of kind of repetitive understanding. Uh, time and, and all from the applications consuming um, these different sources. And so I'm wondering what's a, what's a kind of a sensible path forward uh, that can, that optimizes it somewhat at least. Um, and then the second use case that, that I wanna talk about is this um, cross-institutional identities mapping onto uh, data access. So one use case that um, we commonly sort of hear about and would like to implement over the next few years is the ability to combine data and resources uh, for users. 
So as, as things stand today, if a user has um, a Jetstream allocation and is able to obtain some resource capacity from Jetstream, they do so by submitting an application to exceed, um, going through the, the allocation approval process, assuming they are granted an allocation, they can then um, log in to exceed, presumably using their institutional credentials, uh, proxy through CI logon, um, launch a few virtual machines on Jetstream, um, stand up their Galaxy instance on, on that, attach some disk, and on one sort of half of half half the story is complete. They have now uh, provisioned infrastructure for themselves that's uh, that's within their own control. And assuming they and their institution is uh, okay with using that information for for, uh, for housing protected data sets, they can now move on to the second part of the story, which is obtaining uh, protected data sets. To do so. They have to go through the, the DBCAP, which is an NIH's database um, that, that houses and sort of controls access to these data sets. To do so, they have to log in using the, their ERA Commons account, which may be linked through their institutional identity. And so, but, but they're perceived here as two separate users. Um, and, and this connection between the infrastructure and the data is. Um, is disconnected, right? So the solution that, for example, the NIH RAS project is trying to solve, we're reintroducing here by using infrastructure from the NIH with, uh, or sorry, data from the NIH with infrastructure from the NSF. And so I, just as a kind of a recap of what this process um, looks like at a, kind of one, one level deeper, is when somebody is working with protected data sets, as a researcher, they have to submit an application to data access committee uh, who reviews their application and assuming the application is approved, they are then granted the permission to uh, download the data. And so this, this can take quite a while, um, especially as the sort of availability of this data is, is exploding. The scale um, at which this needs to be happening going forward is is going to only make the situation worse. And so if, unless we sort of adopt more automation in this process, and again, marrying sort of the infrastructure with the data more seamlessly, um, the, the, this process is only going to get uh, prolonged, implying some challenges for researchers and, um, and, and longer timelines on completing the projects. And so, Another sort of uh, example where I felt uh, I've been kind of introduced to a couple of projects that seem to have um, sort of similar scope is the uh, GA4GH passports and visas. Um, this is a sort of a recommendation from GA4GH. So not necessarily uh, NIH, you could say, but the idea is that the passports are sort of like the, the physical ones we use in the real world is um, a passport is identified, I mean, is linked to an identity and provides this um, consistency and ability to reuse that identity across different, um, um, different data sets, different um, uh, access points to retrieve the data that they, uh, that they need. And um, furthermore, it supports this federation as across institutions because it, it um, because of that consistency that it comes with and hence helps with data aggregation because a lot of times you may want to get a couple of data sets uh, from a couple of different uh, uh, space, I mean, places um, in, 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 in integrate them, so to speak. Meanwhile, we have a SCIM or System for Cross Domain Identity Management um, that seems relevant here uh, to say the very least. Um, it, it allows to kind of manage user identities from, um, from multiple um, uh, or from multiple sources, I think, um, and, and is available as a sort of a service uh, or could be available as a service um, that, that applications then consume in many ways, I guess, similar to how Custis is being uh, proposed and, and used. 
Um, meanwhile, it provides this notion of common uh, user schema and extension model and, and grouping. So you could imagine, because like the, the, the picture here, I forgot to mention that this researcher, the PI that requested um, access to the data uh, can then delegate based on their own uh, assessment to delegate access to this data uh, to their own lab, lab mates uh, or people working in their lab. So here you have a notion that if we can introduce the notion of a group uh, and a high level control access uh, by the PI, they go through the process of getting access to the data, placing the data in the right uh, secure location, but then delegating access to other members of their group. And so again, this is where, where I feel like there's, there's potential for uh, some cross-pollination. And so with that, um, as I said, this is, this is kind of mostly a presentation about questions and uncertainty because we, as I, we've had a difficult time finding people with expertise in this space to work on, on this project, on these projects uh, in dedicated capacity. And, um, and so I wanted to take the time with this presentation to kind of bring these topics up, uh, a couple of specific use cases, and see if there are recommendations on how we can sort of bridge the two worlds a little bit better, how we can reuse the, um, the already existing functionality, um, and maybe even how can we minimize some of the uh, uh, overlap in sort of implementation on the two different paths. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to stop and ask if there are any questions or comments. I, I know at least one or two people here are sort of have become aware of these projects in recent months, and maybe there's work ongoing. Um, but yeah, I wanted to kind of use the, a larger forum to talk about these. Great. Thanks, Anis. Um, yeah, that's a great intro to a Q&A period where um, People can ask you questions or maybe answer the questions that you asked also. So um, please, everyone, go ahead, un unmute yourself and um, join the discussion. Hi, and this is Tom Barton from Internet2. And um, I'm a bit familiar with some of that stuff, especially in the NIH side uh, and in the Federation side. Um, I'll just note a little bit of, uh, first of all, a little bit of complicating good news that the uh, ERA Commons credentials are being deprecated. So they're still there now and will be used uh, for a while in some legacy uses. But by and large, they're being replaced by NIH with either a federated credential from your home institution or a federated access via login.gov credentials. Um, so just, just FYI. But in, both cases, I think that there that may actually be a step in the positive direction towards kind of having that um, experience where the users are across various instances and the infrastructure regarded as the same and their permissions managed accordingly, uh, in part because there's going to be a more reliance on federated identities um, through uh, NIH and in particular through the, the RAS. So that may be a little, that's much less than you're asking for in terms of taking this ecosystem of all kinds of independently created projects and trying to rationalize them better. That's a huge problem when you have to keep chipping away at. Um, there's no, I don't know any magic for addressing that problem uh, in one step, but certainly making people aware of other shoulders they can stand on so that their limited efforts, their time bounded efforts can go farther is helpful. And so you're know, raising these things is certainly a bit of a step. And thanks for that. Thanks there wasn't a question in there, just a little bit. Of yeah, no, uh, thanks for the perspective. I didn't know ERA was uh, was getting deprecated. So that's uh, that, that's good to know, if nothing else, just personally. Um, so yeah, and again, that that's the point of this was kind of uh, when Jim uh, proposed this workshop, um, it sounded like open discussion in a forum where people can bring up challenges was as much as uh, as presenting solutions. So I figured, you know, we got 40 people or so here that, that are hopefully now a bit more aware and can take it home and um, the next time run this thought through their heads before um, adopting a solution.
I'll jump in with a question. Um, <clears throat> one of the things you raised was this idea of um, a PI having been authorized to gather some data and wants to be able to then delegate it to their lab staff or graduate students or whoever else needs to actually do some of the work. Uh, and the, what comes to mind is what is the necessary uh, authorization infrastructure to delegate that permission to a PI and how far does it go? So like if I give it, you know, if I'm the PI and I get permission and I give it to my lab manager, does my lab manager get to give that permission to a graduate student who's there for three months on a postdoc and then disappears and how do I revoke it and how do I then report this all back up to the originating uh, data owner or authority that is permitted to give, uh, you know, somebody access. I, I know that it's all cumbersome. Um, but you know, part of that I think needs to be that loop needs to be closed as well on the automation, so that when you delegate or give somebody permission, somehow there needs to be um, traceability of all of that, uh, and also the ability to uh, control that in a meaningful way that doesn't then put a whole lot of burden on a PI who just wants to get to the data and doesn't want to have to learn how to, you know, um, manage some sort of infrastructural author authorization framework. Um, absolutely, and and um, so I mean I find this a bit um, I don't know, unclear to say the least, um, because the way this has been explained to me um, that once uh, a PI has been granted access, it is within their purview to decide who um, gets access. So there's no um, application that they're supposed to submit and say, I need these four people to now have access. Once they've been granted access, it is their responsibility uh, to ensure that that data has been downloaded to a location that is adequately safe, um, which, which is a challenge for the researchers because there's not very many locations that check all the boxes. Um, technically, however, it is the institution that employs the PI that is responsible. Uh, that's what the NIH's documentation uh, states. But um, you know, seeing how many PIs there are and how many data sets uh, are being applied for and, and uh, being granted uh, access, um, universities would need to have a, a department uh, to hand, handle those requests if that was actually being used in practice. Um, so it's, it's to a large degree uh, at the discretion of the PI. And um, you know, you can hear sort of anecdotal stories of how this is being done today, but um, Hence, I guess, is having a system where you can log in, and you know we've just seen some of the challenges uh, dealing with the uh, Google dataset um, or Google uh, doc permissions. You know, here we might have uh, similar issues down the line, but it, at least having that visibility from a central location would be a huge step forward. Um, because as it stands, it it can fluctuate from a you know here's a a server where we deposited the data, you have an account on it to uh, you know, any other number of options I don't really want to go through them. So. Yeah, I mean, once once the data leaves the known uh, approved storage location, um, you really, you know, you have no way to enforce any sort of control, and it's 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 a it's a never ending problem, obviously. But um, somehow, if the institution is taking responsibility for the data sets for which it's been authorized, uh, they're going to want to be able to audit that somehow. And, and uh, so at least one should be prepared to build the infrastructure necessary to do a reasonable degree of uh, um, monitoring, um, for lack of a better term, uh, if only to give people a, a sense of safety that, you know, things aren't get, getting out in the wild and getting to unauthorized readers. Um, you know, people have international uh, collaborations. Um, you know, one's ability to reach and enforce things uh, very quickly diminishes, um, you know, the further you go away from institutions. So, um, it, I mean, it's a, we're not going to solve the problem here, but I just think that as we're thinking this through, we need to really think the whole life cycle. Um, and, and part of it may also be, you know, to push back up on the, on the data generators or you know the ones who originally have the data is like wait a minute you know why does this data need to be sensitive in the first place can it be sufficiently processed to a point of being useful uh, for some research purpose 
without being say identifiable to a human subject or something right i mean could you could you do other things to push the um the need for uh, uh strong um monitoring um could you lessen that by changing the nature of the data of course yeah. everybody will argue that you can triangulate data and, and make uh assertions about whose data it really is and and all that sort of thing that problem's never going to go away as well and perhaps the more dangerous um suggestion is somebody triangulating inc incorrectly and making a an assertion that this is you know data about derek when it's not really data about derek and then he has to manage that that uh public relations nightmare so um it, anyway we just I, I think uh there's an awful lot of interesting and good work happening in this area. Um, I know that there are this and other workshops coming up that will talk about um, technologies for trying to manage some of this stuff. Um, and uh, uh, I encourage you to persist in doing what you're doing. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, just as a, as a couple of examples of um, projects that are out there that are sort of trying to work around this problem um our anvil which i mentioned uh the nih one and uh all of us which uh the, the nih anvil one uh, is combining the the data the infrastructure and the applications into one space and hopefully uh eliminating but you know reducing certainly reducing the need for people to download the data um and hence uh not needing to be worried about the infrastructure uh, meanwhile, all of us is uh, is another NIH project that uh, does not allow any egress. So you have to work within their platform. So they've gone down this uh, extreme path of everything has to happen within the platform um, to hopefully eliminate this challenge of how do you um, um, how do you protect data downstream and once it escapes the 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 walls of um, compliance-based infrastructure. Yeah, just a couple examples. It's certainly the always been a, a battle in in um, in any increasingly data-oriented computing um, to be able to locate your compute infrastructure uh, close enough to the data because forget permissions and authorization, just moving the data is a big pain in the ass. And there's just too much of it now. Um, and so I think increasingly, it, it may be the case uh, that we're trying to evolve uh, uh, sort of, um, I don't know, uh, islands of, of storage and sufficient compute cap cap capability and maybe pipelines and things of that nature so that you can have these sufficiently protected ecosystems where you gain access to the entire ecosystem and the ecosystem has the data you need and the and the applications you need to to do your data of course for people originating their own um data processing applications <clears throat> that may or may not be sufficient but um i think we may be getting into this uh i mean at some level nsf and nih and other funding agencies don't want to get into the business of creating uh, large silos that they want to maintain over time. Um, uh, and they really do want to try and use, uh, say, public cloud and other, you know, infrastructures that may be available to reduce the infrastructure maintenance uh, concerns. But no matter what they do, they're going to have to put some sort of bounds out around things that are that is manageable and that um, precludes or at least makes extremely difficult uh, opportunities for unintended egress of the data. Derek, I'll just add you and Jim, I know you're going to cut me off now, so you can give it back to me. Um, that uh, going back to your initial thing about uh, delegation and managing that, just take a look at Grouper. There's many things that can do it. Grouper is a great one. I have a biased opinion. Uh, you won't be surprised when we do look at Grouper, but it has a great facility for managing delegation. So just so you know. Yeah, yep. Tom, you're eating into your own time here, so uh, that's <laughs> that's only fair. But uh, Ennis, thank you very much for your presentation and for uh, for initiating that discussion. I'll, I'll say, on behalf of Trusted CI, uh, we're happy to uh, assist in this discussion moving forward. So 
maybe offline we could do some brainstorming about um, you know, next steps and how to work within Common and some other partners to um, to keep this discussion going. Um, but uh, in the interest of uh, keeping on schedule, let me ask Tom to um, share his screen and begin his presentation. Thanks. All right. Please tell me when you can see um, the slides. Oh, it's still there. We go. Can you see that, Jim? I do. Thanks. Okay, great. So this is the talk. I'm Tom Barton from Internet Two. I uh, used to say Chicago and Internet Two, but I just recently retired from the University of Chicago. So shorten that a little bit. So let me um, start with some basic background. People have talked about federated identity representation already, and probably most everyone here is familiar enough. I thought it would start there really quickly. Um, this whole federated thing is kind of indicated with this diagram. There's things called identity providers and service providers. The service providers are the things that have resources that are protected and people need to log into to access or work with or work on. The identity providers are what they log in from. That's usually, most typically, it's a home organization, a university uh, login service that's outfitted for to work in federation. Uh, 73 countries, as of a couple of days ago, have national research and education federations, and common is the US's uh, federation. And they work, each federation uh, kind of provides a foundation for trusted transactions between service provider entities and identity provider entities uh, by the federation operators uh, following uh, strict procedures and policies. And they register entities in their national federations where they get various information, they verify it, uh, they publish it, make it available to all the different identity providers and service providers, um, well, around the world now, courtesy of the Edugame Interfederation Service. That operates. And then, so if you're part of federation, you can do this thing where a user, you don't have to, if you're a service, you don't have to manage your own credentials. You can rely on federated authentication. And so the user will use their more familiar home organization or campus credentials um, in most cases. And then you don't have to, to necessarily belong to a federation. You can be bridged or gateway or proxy in, which is a very common thing in the uh, research space. So you can kind of see that showing here. So you can give the benefit of federated access even to resources that are not themselves directly a part of federation. Now, so indeed researchers uh, really like this stuff. And um, a couple of years ago, they uh, culminating a year and a half with the work, a bunch of research communities got together and figured out how really it's great, but to make it even better um, and to address some shortcomings, there's a bunch of things that they wish federations and members of federations would do. And I kind of summarize this in my own ways. It's not from that paper, but um, as a pyramid of capabilities or characteristics, <clears throat> that would be especially valuable for research collaborations and research cyber infrastructure. So they kind of go from bottom to top being more basic to more advanced kind of thing. At the very top, of course, it's, not a, it's, not, it's a use made of all those good things, enabling research collaborations and cyber infrastructures to better manage and reduce their risk. Uh, but that goes all the way from the bottom two lines uh, of, the, of, the, of the pyramid, which really mostly address um, user experience and manageability of all of the different things that articulate and interoperate in Federation through some basic security of those things. Um, and then this research and scholarship program is about passing a few attributes, name, email, affiliation, and a persistent identifier. Um, privacy kind of infringing attributes sometimes, but that's done in a program where the federation operators of each of the national federations follow uh, standard uh, registration practices to vet each service provider that wants to receive such things and decides whether or not it's appropriate for them to do. So it's actually a data minimizing practice um, altogether. And so a good thing from the point of view of privacy management. And then in those middle, uh, uh, you have stronger authentication, the MFA, how to signal that, as well as the confidence that the organization that has created a credential for someone, how confident they are in who they've issued that credential to, what's, how much identity proof do they do. So all of those things really help research collaborations, in part because there very often is no contract, unlike in a B2B service, uh, where, which will address 
who's got what responsibilities, where the liabilities are assigned and all that kind of stuff. So in the research space, that's often not the case. Even with NIH, there's a contract with the, an awarded institution, but it doesn't address this kind of stuff about how to make the federated access work well for the access subordinate to that contract. And so these help everyone to manage risk better. Now, how does InCommon go about making this stuff happen? Well, slowly, it's hard, but there is a program called Baseline Expectations. Um, and it's the way that the most important aspects of trust, things in that pyramid, get implemented across in common ubiquitously, not just as a best practice where we ask people really, really nicely and often to please do something, but it's actually incumbent on them as a matter of a legal obligation based upon their participation in the in common federation. So they almost are obliged to adhere to the baseline expectations. And what those are evolve slowly over time under the direction of something called the Community Trust and Assurance Board of in common, which is community membership. So the community led a setting of what the base, where the baseline is going to go next. And an awful lot of work uh, within the community led by CTAB to decide, make that, to arrive at that decision and uh, other processes that help support um, the ongoing implementation of them. So baseline expectations is a real good change management uh, program. So baseline so far has, uh, has one rev and is working in, in the second one's underway right now. The first one dealt with the bottom row of, the, of that uh, pyramid. And the one that's currently underway addresses the next two. So basically we're adding really kind of a focus on security. And there, there's uh, the main elements are that all the entities have to have an SSL lab score of A, okay, any kind of A. And uh, Jim, I think mentioned also certified a moment ago, or at least had a link in the chat to it, which has to do with and uh, incident response in the federated environment and some basic preparations. So those are becoming ubiquitous in common, in common right now. Well, that's in common and, and stuff that's good for that federations can do to help uh, research collaborations that want to rely on federated access. So what's up with NIH? Of course, everyone knows NIH. If you didn't know NIH before last March or so, you do now, <laughs> I mean, a year or so March. There's hundreds of US campuses and others that perform NIH funded research or collaborate with researchers employed at NIH. And most of those campuses are in common members. And NIH has said in a couple of different ways and places, something that in common really appreciates and just appreciate generally here, that this, those practices in common, kind of in the pyramid are really strategic to them. They have found NIH that the time to get researchers connected to their resources and collaborators is far shorter uh, when federation, federated access is involved than otherwise. They even have instances where it would take weeks, I think as mentioned earlier, uh, down to a day because of the federated access, which is good. So science starts to happen sooner. Um, so they really want this stuff to work. And, 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 and they're also advancing kind of with like, like as it was, what was mentioned in the last, Anna's was mentioning uh, with the RAS service and others across NIH, there's a new, NIH Federation Gateway that's being in place momentarily almost, that is capable of using all of those elements in that pyramid, so I'll show you in a moment, to help those downstream applications like RAS to meet their security obligations and manage their risk appropriately, even though there may be federated access as a component of those downstream systems. So they want to do so to, to manage controlled access research data, also the ERA systems for grants administration and allied things. And there's three things that they really want that are new-ish. They want the people, the users that are logging in, uh, to more efficiently provision them. They want MFA oftentimes. And sometimes they're also going to want identity assurance information about the user logging in. And so I'm gonna get into each of these in a minute. But, um, and these, these are the standards that, uh, NIH has selected. They are international standards, not US national standards for these two things. Um, and that's probably because they have, of course, researchers that they want to work with who are all over the world. And so an international standard approach is a better fit for that. So they're gonna rely on the research and scholarship entity category. That's one of those uh, levels in the pyramid. Something called the MFA profile, another level in that pyramid, and the REFED's assurance framework. And so that has to do with the identity proofing stuff. And so I'll show you in a moment. 
So, so in other words, baseline is uh, going to provide everything up to, but not including the new requirements that NIH is making of, of accounts uh, that are uh, federated accounts that are going to be accessing some of their internal services. And it's also interesting to kind of note, they chose those next three, there's good reasons for them in terms of their risk management. Um, does that suggest a direction for a baseline V3, for example? And I think a lot of the folks on the in Commons Community Trust and Assurance Board are asking that same question and, and musing along the same lines. Um, this is the scholarship entity category, briefly. This is a way, <clears throat> I think I kind of summarized it a moment ago, where a, a service provider like the NIH Federation Gateway can ask for can 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 ask for these these attributes, name, email, affiliation, and a persistent identifier. They're vetted, as I said a moment ago, by the federation operators, uh, and then identity providers can choose to participate by whenever they have a, one of their users logging into an RNS tagged whatever that is a service provider, that the identity provider will automatically release those attributes to you. So that um, makes it nice. In terms of the assurance, there was a refed assurance framework earlier, and it has a number of elements to it. It's got three components on the left called the refed assurance framework kind of proper, and also some authentication profiles you see on the right. There you'll see there's a multi-factor authentication profile, and there's also one for single factor. If you're going to have just a password, for example, or one other single factor, what, what's good enough, you know, is what that profile um, uh, describes. And so, um, it talks, there's, a, a, there's some claims that can be made about identifiers and their uniqueness, about identity assurance levels, about the freshness of attributes, as well as about the strength of authentication. So for the NIH use case, they're concerned with just the assurance ones and the, the multi-factor authentication uh, profile. So the MFA profile. Um, is a, as I said, it signals MFA. It doesn't itself communicate that MFA happened just by having the profile implemented, but it's a, it's a channel whereby the service, the relying party can request MFA happen uh, at the login side. And the identity provider that logs the user in can reply, yes, I did that, I did it, or no, it didn't happen, so you know. So at least, so there's a positive uh, information in the hands of the service provider about whether or not MFA happened for this session right now and, uh, and so they can, they can apply their access policies accordingly. Um, and for identity assurance, there are this, there's, there's this uh, low, medium, and high, which kind of you know, are increasing levels of proofing that align well with a variety of standards that have been created uh, for such things. This wall is, as well as another kind of a value of a different sort called local enterprise. It's basically a sort of an eat your own dog food um, uh, um, declaration or claim, which means that if that identity is permitted to access critical internal systems of the home organization, whatever those are, and there's some characterization of them. Um, so it's good enough for us when it matters to us, we're telling you that that's the case for this person. So maybe it's good enough for you. That's kind of the usage of that local enterprise identity assurance claim. So um, let's look at low, medium, and high. And here, this sort of gives you a rough idea about how much identity proofing, how much identity assurance each one conveys. Uh, low, not much. It's just self-attested. I'm Jason. I'm alive. You, know, you probably have, there's an email for me to say here so you can contact me, but there's nothing else really. There's no external check on who, who Jason really is. But we get to that with this medium uh, level of assurance. Uh, Jason um, you know, shows like a government issued ID card or passport or something like that, or a driver's license, for example. And it has a picture on it and it's not expired and things like that so that the uh, person can check that, uh, a registrar, and, um, and, and, and agree. Oh, that, you know, according to this ID card, that really is Jason. So good enough, here's your credential. Um, so you can access things at this institution. And then Pi goes a step farther. It, narrows the set of identity documents that might be used to those that have some other characteristics, making them harder to um, duplicate or fraudulently produce, like holograms and things like that. 
And it also uh, is a table that contains information that can be corroborated from an authoritative source. So the validation process for the identity evidence, the identity documents that are, that are used is stronger, as well as the documents themselves being part of the smooth. So that's the high level of identity assurance. By mentioning all this stuff in this much detail, thinking about people that may have these kinds of needs and a relying party, you've got a resource that has some sensitive stuff, you've got uh, security objectives you must meet. Some of those uh, devolve down to the strength of the uh, authentication and the identity credentials used by the users. And so this kind of material can help you manage those risks and decide and help you decide what level of identity assurance might you want to shoot for, for your service. Um, the IAP stuff, the assurance stuff in NIH, was that the, the, there was a transition to services needing and acquiring these uh, uh, IAP assertions annually, is um, going to be taking place um, on different schedules by different services and over a period of time, probably through the end of next year anyway. Uh, so it's a kind of a slow process in recognition that it's actually a, quite a heavy lift for organizations to start to operationalize this business about for each of their users to know how much identity proofing went into them, went into them when they were onboarded to their organization. Uh, in common is encouraging the campuses to start with this local enterprise value. It's easier to implement uh, than the low, than the medium or high profiles anyway. Um, and it's also expected to be valuable for at least some NIH services and others. Um, Examples would be, you know, when there's a, when a new employee is hired, there's an I-9 process that might take you a certain distance down the road, maybe towards medium. Uh, how the campus ID card office works may well also provide you medium, or in some cases, even uh, high level assurance depending on their processes and procedures. And of course, you always have to make sure that you connect the identity proofing process to the network credential you assign the person somehow, and there's a variety of ways, it's not rocket science, but there's a variety of ways that that's done. So uh, I thought I'd uh, come to a conclusion to show you how far things are coming along for both baseline and institutions adopting the, uh, implementing the, the new NIH part. Um, first of all, baseline uh, V2, it just got started with the public announcement on February 19th. For July, as of July 9th, 55% uh, uh, of the way there. So it's pretty good progress starting from seven going up to 55 in a few months time. Um, the actual formal um, baseline B2 is the law of the land kind of a declaration it comes out, I think later today, right, very shortly. Uh, that's not when, uh, so that will mean that people will need, uh, there'll be sort of a deadline of probably towards the end of the year to actually finish implementing uh, all that they need to do to meet the baseline B2 requirements to do with the security of their entities. And then for um, the, um, uh, the NIH readiness. So the NIH um, have created a compliance check tool. You see the URL down there in the bottom left. Um, and you can go there and it tests whether or not when if someone logs in there, uh, did the IDP, actually, you know, did it perform the MFA profile Incorrectly, so could they tell that it was uh, MFA happened or not? And it also checks, knows how to check the various IAP kinds of signals that can be sent using the Refresh Assurance uh, Framework. Um, well, Jim's presence here signals to me that I'm just about done. <laughs> I'll just say that um, it's this NIH is a huge, complicated organization, as we know. The different services all have their own schedules and their own risk management processes and so forth. So these new requirements are going to come out one at a time, a service at a time, on, their, on whatever time frames. And there's no one at NIH who actually knows what all they are thinking because not each of them are actually thinking uh, you know, at the same time about these things. So it'll start peppering, those requirements will start to be peppered across some of the more valuable NIH resources over the coming one month to 18 months or thereabouts. And I think that's what I have to say. Oh, that wants to leave with a slide. You can get it in the, the slides on the Google Drive uh, workshop. But there's a lot of details uh, in especially those first two bullets. Get on the HREADY wiki page, which has all the details that a, a campus needs to know how to go about uh, doing what they have to do to meet the NIH requirements. One of those, uh, there was a lot of work done, which was completed recently by a working group sponsored by the 
Community Trust and Assurance Board about implementation guidance for the assurance stuff. And so that's also, it's both for them to implement, and it's also really good for folks who may be relying on this stuff and want to know what does it mean when a campus says IAP medium, how far should I throw that? Um, that should also give you some good ideas about what goes behind those claims so you know you know how to take them in terms of your risk assessment. And I'll stop right there. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Tom. Right on time. Uh, it's, it's really good to get a, a status update. Um, that last chart you showed with the July 11th uh, status update. Good to see the progress there. So I think Mark Dietrich has our first question queued up in the chat. So uh, Mark, if you're willing, if you could unmute and ask your question, maybe you could say, uh, for those of us who aren't experts on verifiable credentials uh, defined by W3C, maybe you could give us a uh, uh, a quick overview of what those are um, as a background to your question. Sure, um, and thanks. Thanks, Tom, and everybody else. I'm, I, some of these topics may have been covered before, so I apologize for joining late, but um, the uh, I do a lot of work in Europe, and one of the activities that's going on there is consideration of what they call self-sovereign identity, as well as distributed identifiers, so there's a bit of a, we've got a cognitive dissonance building up with the, the AARC blueprint, which uh, Tom, you, you basically described in, in some of your pictures, that pyramid, et cetera. Um, and one piece that's quite prominent in that is the idea that rather than depending on the institution to figure out, okay, uh, you know, what's on your driver's license and does this look authentic? And are you the person you say you are? Uh, the European approach has been, well, we're going to set up a thing called verifiable credentials, which is a standard set up in W3C. Don't ask me for the link. It's somewhere. Um, but basically that says, look, we have a way of reaching out to the, to the driver's license issuing organization, and we can independently verify that the the driver's license number that you provided is in fact you, and they can confirm that back to us. And we don't need to make any judgment calls about that, which seemed to be what was happening with that, that lady behind the desk at IAPI. She was saying, well, I looked at the driver's license and it looks, looks good to me. Um, so I'm wondering if, if there's any conversation about IAP super high or <laughs> something like that that would be a fully decentralized credential checking process, which is apparently feasible. It's, it's, we're not there yet, but wondering if that's in the thinking at all. It is, and you know, what you described really is sort of a different division of labor for the same, for the same work. Uh, somewhere that credential checking has to happen for the corresponding assurance levels. Um, there's a variety of ways it can be done. It can be done by, it needs to be done or it can't, it, it needs to be associated with the organization that issues a credential. That binding between proofing and credential usage is important, it's, it's pivotal. But there's a variety of ways that can be done. It don't, you don't necessarily have to employ the lady at the desk to do the checking in order to get there. In fact, as you kind of re referenced, there are a small number now, but slowly increasing set of commercial service providers that do identity proofing services for you. So it's a hard job to go to authoritative data, you know, to the issuers of passports and driver's license all over the various states and countries and so forth, um, and other kinds of authorities, not just necessarily the issuers in the government agencies themselves. So that has to, for the high level, that has to be that has to be incorporated one place or another. That's much the same across Europe, Europe and the U.S. And I will point out also, Mark, that this whole refed assurance uh, framework was driven largely by, not exclusively by, research, uh, interviewing the risk needs of research collaborations operating in, in Europe for the most part. And there are a number of them right now that are just watching what InCommon and NIH are doing, hoping that InCommon kind of jumpstarts the uh, feasibility of member organizations, federation member organizations, regular universities and colleges to be able to do this stuff because they want them across Europe as well. So. They want sovereign identity for some things. If that's going to fit, if that shoe fits, wear it. Um, if you're using comb credentials, you know, if that shoe fits, fine. Just the point is the shoe has to fit. And um, like most things, they care a little bit about how this gets done. They care much more about the science being enabled and are really not too concerned about the details of how the things that are required to happen get done. 
So just one quick clarifying comment. You you make a fair point about European institutions and, and research infrastructures uh, figuring out their attitudes towards identity management and so on. Um, the, the move toward SSI and DID and these verifiable credentials is actually going on from the European Commission. And it's actually also being encouraged by some, uh, some industrially driven uh, uh, cloud federation and data ecosystem activities. One of them is called Gaia X, for those of you who are, uh, might have seen it in the news. Anyway, uh, there, is a, there is some difference of opinion even within Europe about how to go about this. So I, I don't want to suggest that, <laughs> that everybody's fully adopted this in, in Europe by any means. Well, no, it's, a, it's the newcomer, I think, at this point. It's still, a, it's an interesting idea. I'm sure it's going to find some application. I mean, we talked, someone mentioned earlier today already that, the, uh, I think it was Marlon, that, you know, uh, with uh, uh, Galaxy or something, that they're interfering with how, how do you trust that um, there were some users that didn't, that weren't at institutions that were part of Incommon, for example. And so they had to do something to address them. Uh, so at least starting there, Mark, uh, those kinds of uh, solutions may well show some, some promise and value and some adoption. Who else has a question for Tom? You know, it's not like this is one thing different than being in the room where you could scare someone down and kind of force them to, to, to say something if, if you have an emotion to. We can also pick up our discussion with Ennis about uh, NIH continued. What are what are good next steps? So in common and on NIH have uh, uh, active working groups right now on federated identity management and, and this new process, um, is, there, is there space to look more broadly at access to data sets and, and some of the challenges across NSF and NIH that NS brought up? Um, should, should that be a follow-on in common working group? Is that the way to proceed on it? Well, it could be one. Um, there's nothing wrong with that at all. If it's a community interest, you know, and it's connected with federated something or other, yeah. Um, that would make that would be very appropriate, or it could also be, especially if it's international, uh, refeds that inter organization, the international organization for uh, research and education federations would be another good locus for that. Uh, either way, I think the the main thing needed is enough interest from in the community. In common to great convener and focuser of community interest, um, it originates very little of this stuff itself. It mostly comes from the community members, um, and so. I think and it's the question, the general question raises a really tough one. The problem with the hard, one first hard step is going to be to carve out one actionable piece of it, you know, as if you knew all of the steps between here and the destination. Well, so if you can just guess at what a first good step might look like, that would be possibly make for good charter material for a working group. I think that would be a fascinating group to participate in. Well, Mark has one one question, and we're close on time. So why don't we give uh, Mark the last question? Go ahead, Mark. Thanks again. Uh, the question I have is: it, it, there was a slide earlier that talked about you know ident identification, authentication, and then authorization. And again, reflecting on some of the discussion that's going on in the European community, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about kind of trying to refine the the authorization process that that is more fine-grained and less uh, it, it, it goes beyond the ACL. It basically says, uh, okay, we want to have a conversation about precisely what you want to do with this data set, for example, what your your planned usage is, um, you know, uh, and this may involve, again, people outside of the research community uh, you know, currently there's a lot of discussion researcher to researcher, which pre, you know, will uh, 
come before the actual data access. There'll be a discussion about what it is you want the data for, and then the, you'll be given access. Uh, but the idea is that, is that some of this, these usage conditions might be built into the authorization process. You might create more of an, an attribute, attribute based access control as opposed to a role based or identity based access control. So I'm wondering if there are any developments in this area that, you know, uh, you know, I'm sort of looking at this from the European perspective. What can I bring back to that European research area that might be going on in, in the U.S. environment that's, that's solving some of these problems or, or taking initial steps? So let me get this. Let me, let me repeat what you just said to make sure I got this right. And then we'll dish it off to Jim, who's going to answer your question for you. You're really looking for some kind of, let's say it's a token, it may as well be. Um, but what it expresses is not just someone's identity, okay? And the resource would check it on a list, you know, what's it on the list. Uh, but it would say, who, the bearer is allowed to do a variety of things, things that maybe the semantics may, are clear in the context of the application they're approaching. Um, gee, that sounds really familiar, Jim. Have you done any work in that, in that area? Would you care to summarize in a, in a minute or two? Yeah, I put, uh, I put two links in the chat there. Um, Ennis already mentioned the GA for GH passports, which is really, really nice work um, that we're working to support in CIOG on. Um, Psy tokens is another example. And then there's the, um, the WLCG authorization working group is the is another example that I'll that I'll. Yeah, I'm actually familiar with the GA for GH passports, not the Psy tokens. So that's <laughs> good to know. Great. Yeah, that's, yeah, go ahead, Jim. Well, if, if I may, uh, you know what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to cut the discussion there and um, transition into our, uh, we've, Jeanette and I have a few slides of wrap up material, but thanks for the, thanks for the good discussion. Um, so let me prepare to do that. Um, okay. And uh, so uh, thank you very much to the presenters uh, for submitting their um, presentation proposals, which were evaluated by the program committee and selected to be presented to you today. I think um, it was a lot of really great uh, content and we had some, some good discussion. I wanna also thank the trusted CI partners that, uh, that help us, helped us pull this program together. We heard, for example, about science gateways and, and um, in common in the last presentation and, and um, other partners also helped us out. Um, I want to take the opportunity to highlight uh, exciting news today. A report has been published from um, this community group that Carolyn and Eric formed on, uh, on regulated research data management. And so um, here's the link uh, to the information about the workshop that they held and the report that um, has just been published and the next steps, which is um, an exciting new uh, regulated research community of practice that um, that'll be launching in August um, coming up. So um, please do check that out. Um, and I, I prompted Marlon to tell us about the Science Gateway and HP Access BOF. Um, just a reminder, that's coming up Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific um, for more discussion about uh, Science Gateway um, uh, security challenges. And let me hand it over to Jeanette, who will talk to us, uh, tell us more about other things coming up like the webinar. Thanks, Jim. Um, if you don't already know, we host a monthly webinar. So our next webinar that's coming up is July 26th, uh, Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Topic, a capability-based authorization infrastructure for distributed high throughput computing. And our presenter is Brian Bockelman from Open Science Grid. You may already be familiar with his work. So please join us for that. Uh, our website is trustedci.org slash webinars. And if you advance, please. And or just a reminder, please uh, check out our um, brief survey. It's just one question at the end. Um, but also if you want uh, uh, documentation of attending this event, for your own professional development purposes, we're issuing badges. Um, that's how we track uh, people attending our various events. So go ahead and um, uh, access that link. I just posted it in the chat. So if you haven't grabbed it yet, please go ahead and do that. Um, and I think that's the rest of mine, Jim. Oh wait, workshop materials, that's right. Um, if you go to trustedci.org slash uh, Oh, wait, let me just throw the link in. It'll just be easier that way. Because <laughs> um, then you can click on it in the chat. There you go. 
There you go. Um, so it's our, our um, information about the workshop and then the link to the, all the materials. If you want to go back and share with colleagues, you can find that there. And um, to stay connected with Trusted CI, again, we've got our webinars that, that's monthly. You can follow us at trustedci.org. Um, we're also on Twitter. We have an email list, announcements and discuss if you want to ask questions. Um, or if you just have any random question and you're not sure where to put it, go to info at trustedci.org. And thanks again, NSF, for your support. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks, everybody. I think that um, wraps us up. Yeah, oh, good, uh, Carolyn. I was going to um, uh, post the link um, if uh, nobody else uh, posted it. So thanks. Um, uh, that report's a really uh, exciting development. So please do check out that, um, that new regulated research community report. And with that, I think uh, we'll adjourn the workshop. Thanks, thanks everyone for participating and have a great week at PERC 21. Bye now. Bye everybody. <laughs>